Hello and welcome to Capturing Christianity. My name is Cameron Bertuzzi. I'm exposing you to the intellectual side of Christian belief. And today we're talking about the William Lane Craig, Sean Carroll debate that occurred in 2014. We're doing a review of it. And let me show you who I've got with me here. We've got Dr. Aaron Wall, Dr. Luke Barnes, and Ronald Cram. And so what I want to do Hello. is... Yeah, I want to give everybody a chance to introduce themselves and explain sort of why they were invited on the stream and just a little about their background and, and why they're all here. So let's start with you, Ronald. Why, uh, why, why, why are you interested in the the Sean Carroll Craig debate? It, you came out with an article that came out fairly recently on it, and uh, so why did you write a review of it? You know, six years later, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, that that is a good question. Uh, so a little a little about me. I am the founder of a Christian ministry called Fact Bridge on uh, university campuses, and I wrote this little booklet here, uh, "Why Three Brilliant Atheists Became Christians," it tells the conversion stories of uh, Dr. Francis Collins, Dr. Alan Sandage, and Lee Strobel, and uh, is part of my. Uh, ministry on university campuses, I was very interested in this uh, debate in 2014. And um, I, I recently wrote this guest blog for Free Thinking Ministries. By the way, quick shout out to Tim Stratton, my friend who published my guest blog. Thank you for doing that. The uh, blog is called um, Sean Carroll's Dishonesty. And I wrote it because I kind of expected uh, some other people more qualified than myself to talk about uh, some of the things that were said. And in fact, Aaron did touch on some of them, but I've, I wanted to put my own emphasis on a couple of things. And so I wrote that. Yeah. And, and then today as we're, we're, let me actually explain this a little bit. So we are going to play some clips. I actually have 10 clips queued up from the debate and Luke, our, our resident scholar here, he's going to, help us with the with the flow of all the clips and, and why they, they all make sense. We're actually not going in chronological order. We're going by topic. And so he's going to help us sort of put these clips into perspective and context. Um, so as, as we play the clips, Ronald is going to have some thoughts and uh, he'll, he'll sprinkle those in. But uh, same thing with all of us. If, if any of us have any thoughts on the clips that we play, then uh, we'll give those and it'll just be basically a conversation between the, the four of us. And I also want to mention this and then I'll pass it over to uh, to Dr. Wall so he can introduce himself. Uh, we're not going to say who we think won or lost the debate until the very end of this video. So we're going to hold off on that if you want to get our thoughts on that. You got to watch the whole thing. All right. So uh, so Dr. Wall, pass it over to you. Uh, hey. So I am a physicist who studies uh, general relativity and quantum gravity and other uh, such topics. And uh, I have a blog called Undivided Looking, Comments on Physics and Theology, where I talk a bit about how our, our understanding of the world from physics and understanding the world from theology relate. I've been a Christian for as long as I can uh, remember. And you know, I think that a lot of people think they have to compartmentalize their thinking in order to make that uh, work out. And I prefer to sometimes take away the compartmentalization and see, look at the universe as a whole. And I think that that, that uh, uh, can make perfect sense in a, in a Christian uh, worldview where all truth belongs to God. So one of the things uh, that's cool... I, I'm currently a lecturer at the University of Cambridge, although I was a postdoc in Santa Barbara, I think, when the debate happened. Uh, so, so one of the things I was going to mention is that you were actually mentioned by Dr. Craig during the debate, and Sean Carroll mentioned that in his post-debate thoughts, that he had gone and, and read through your article and, and found it pretty interesting. So that's one of the reasons why we invited him on, because he was directly quoted and used by Dr. Craig in the debate itself. Well, let's pass over to Luke Barnes. He's been on the show program uh, several times at this point on, on a variety of different topics. Well, mainly actually due to uh, or related to fine tuning. So, and actually in this, this discussion, we're not going to focus a whole lot on the fine tuning part of the debate. We may, I think we have one clip that we may or may not get to on fine tuning, but it's because in Luke, tell, tell everyone why we're not doing that. Oh, uh, because uh, I don't have three hours to spare. <laughs> so we try and cover everything in the debate. I think, you know, 
Uh, that'll take ages. And there's there's plenty there in just the sort of the... the, the so the debate's basically there's the Kalam bit and there's the fine-tuning bit. And there's plenty in the Kalam for us to get on with. So, yeah, I'm, I'm Luke Barnes. I'm a, I'm a cosmologist and astrophysicist at Western Sydney University. Well, I, the, one of the things I was hoping that you were going to mention is that you've done videos on responding to Sean Carroll's critiques of the fine-tuning argument already. Is that right? Yeah, so Alan Hainline, a friend of mine from Texas, uh, so we got together on his uh, on YouTube channel, and uh, the, so Sean's uh, comments on the fine-tuning argument, there were five replies, so we did five little videos just responding to those. They're, they're, they're reasonable objections, that, that, uh, but I think there are good answers to them, so, so people can go and find that. Right, so if you want to get more information about how Luke responds to Sean Carroll, those five points that he makes against the fine-tuning argument, those thoughts are already there. So the, the main focus of this one will be on the Kalam, but it'll also be, there's a there's a variety of different topics that were discussed during the discussion. Well, before we get to that, before we start playing any clips, let's get to some sort of general overall comments about the debate. And uh, just don't discuss, we can talk about anything, but don't don't discuss yet who you think won. <laughs> so who, who would like to start? How about, let, let's pass it over to you, Ronald. Well, I any, thought the any, debate like, generic thoughts. Yeah, just generically, I thought the the debate was very interesting. Um, it was uh, interesting to me because Sean Carroll came out saying, "I'm not really here to win a debate," uh, and then felt like he really was trying to win a debate. So it w it was a very interesting uh, perspective to see, and uh, and I'm glad that that they did it. How about you, Aaron? Because this was something interesting. So Aaron told me that he had only read the transcripts and it was just very recently that he watched the debate. That was, that, I found that pretty interesting. Uh, yeah, you probably don't even know how recently. <laughs> I just watched with my PhD student. Uh, I think we finished about a couple hours ago. But <laughs> I hate uh, huh. watching videos when I can process the information so much faster if there's a written text. So I'd much rather read it. So when I was writing all these blog articles responding to, I was just reading the transcript. What are your overall thoughts on the on the debate, Aaron? Well, I thought, of course, William Lane Craig is a very he's a many debated many times before. So he's got his act completely polished and was very disciplined and focused, whereas Carol had came out more, you know, wild and chaotic and swinging. That being said, I think uh, he really gave a point of view as a cosmologist that maybe, and a physicist that maybe you don't always see in these discussions. So I thought it was kind of kind of interesting. I think sometimes Carol Winnett stepped a little bit outside the bounds, and uh, Craig called him on it, but I don't think that uh, uh, changes that he was raising some very interesting points. How about you, Luke? Yeah, there's plenty of debates between Christians and, and atheists or between whoever that I wouldn't go back to five minutes after. Uh, so the reason why this one's interesting is because they they really they went at each other. So there's an awful lot of debates where William Lane Craig does his like you know his polished performance, and then the the atheists just waste their time and goes off on tangents. But Sean, you know. Uh, Sean has a respect for philosophy, which uh, if you don't see that in a physicist, often they just spin their wheels and completely lose the plot. But Sean, because he, he's worked hard and he's talked to an awful lot of philosophers, he knows a lot of philosophy, he knows how to, you know, how to engage an argument at, at that level, which is why the, the back and forth was really interesting. So, you know, it's worth going back to and, and, and understanding the points that were made. And similarly, also... Craig... Not a physicist, but he's done a lot of homework getting up to speed on a lot of these issues. And even if he could never be as much of an expert as Carol, I think it's impressive how much as somebody coming from outside that discipline, he's managed to acquaint himself with the field. Let's talk about that a little bit more. So Aaron and Luke, as you were watching that debate, did it seem like Craig, because both of you are, are physicists, did it seem like Craig knew what he was talking about? It seemed like he, were there any points where you were like, okay, that's not really technically right? Uh, oh. It's, <laughs> come on, I'll let Luke talk. 
I mean, there's there's a couple where uh, so uh, let me take an example. So Craig alleges has a has a certain allegation against Carol's model of uh, how the universe has low entropy, or you know the the, the second law of thermodynamics. And Craig says that his model is not unitary, and that's a pretty straightforward thing to check. And he was wrong about that. And Craig points that out. There's no way Craig's going to be. I mean, so Carol, uh, that's not. Uh, Sean points that out. Uh, there's no way he's going to be wrong about that. Uh, so there's a couple Actually, of times when, you know, wrong about that. Oh, interesting. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll read the paper again and, and I don't see whether, anyway, uh, you know, there's explicit time. Anyway, um, so there was a couple of times when actually, yeah, but for the, for the most part, I think actually the, the disagreements about, sci uh, uh, science as we can get to soon, we're actually kind of a distraction. There's a there's a more interesting difference between them underneath. Yeah. Well, what about you, Aaron? Do you think that there were any points where where Craig just really got the the physics wrong? Not. There are parts where it was kind of a little fuzzy, um, like when he was talking about the Boltzmann brain uh, objection. I thought, you know, I think one could have sharpened that up a bit more as a. Uh, uh, physicist, but I, oh, is that on our agenda to discuss later? <laughs> the Boltzmann brain thing does does pop up. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's in one of the clips. Well, let me say this: I want to talk a, a little about the the rhetoric of this debate because I think online most people that were watching this debate, including myself, when I first watched it, I thought that that Sean Carroll just completely destroyed Craig. That that's probably being too hyperbolic. I thought Craig lost. I thought Dr. Craig lost the debate. And the reason why I thought that initially, as I've reflected on it, because I eventually came to, to the opposite. Well, I just gave away. I just gave away what I yes, think. Yes, you did. Anyways, you I'm going to save that up. I'm going to let the other that. guys. Well, let me, keeping a poker face. I know, I know, I know. Uh, well, I think it's important to talk about the the, rhetoric, the rhetorical aspect of this debate, because I think that's what p played a big part in how people judged it. And so I think that in there's there's two things, basically, that Sean had in his favor that that led to most people thinking that that he won the debate. The first one is that his his credentials as a bona fide physicist, he has a PhD from Harvard. Most people coming into the debate recognize that, acknowledge that, and he's they're going to put a little bit more confidence in the things that he says purely based on his credentials. Dr. Craig has a, a PhD in philosophy and a PhD in theology, so he's a philosopher theologian coming to a debate with a physicist on cosmology. So Carol just sort of automatically has a a leg up in that respect in terms of credentials. So that's that's a rhetorical thing that, that can happen where it's credentials aren't necessarily bad, but it can lead someone to think that someone won an argument purely based on their, their credentials or saying it more confidently, even though that they may not have the, the right view or their view might be in complete contradiction with the majority of experts in their field. So I think credentials is a big reason why a lot of people think that it, that he won. Another reason is because of his confidence. If you listen to the debate, and this is why it's interesting that Aaron didn't, uh, he, he hadn't even watched it until you said a, a few hours ago. So you didn't hear a lot of the rhetoric that uh, that Carol used. And when I say rhetoric, it just means that he was, he was very confident. His tone and his inflection was was very uh, powerful. It was very persuasive, very convincing. And I think that those that combination of credentials and confidence is what convinced a lot of people that uh, that he was the the clear winner in this debate. So, anyways, a lot of any that thoughts? Does come across on the transcript actually. It's something. There's a way the way he says things. It's very, very. Uh, I know what I'm talking about, and I'll lay that for you. Yeah. <laughs> any other additional thoughts on that? And and then after that, we'll we'll move on to to play some of these clips. I would say that one of the things I think that gives uh, Sean Carroll a leg up is he's just a very likable guy on camera. He's mm. he seems he comes across to me as as very likable. Of course, William Lane Craig does as well. But um, there was something about that combination of of his credentials and his likability that people wanted to believe him. I think. Any other thoughts, Luke? Oh, he's, he's quite likable in person as well. Having met him a couple of times, so. Um, yeah, I, I think he's just a polished speaker because he's done this a lot. He's written popular books. He's written, talked to a lot of popular scientific, well, popular audiences about his science. So you know, he just he, he knows how to 
to, to lay that out quite nicely. And he brought that quite pretty well to a debate format. He didn't waste his time. He had his points to make, and he and he made them. You know, um, it, 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 this is why it's a debate worth going over. They really did, mm-hmm. you know, go at each other. They did. Okay, well, let's start playing some of these clips so we can get as much of these in, in uh, <coughs> as we can. So we have ten clips queued up. And Luke, tell us. Well, this first one is about is is about framing the whole debate. So we may not need a whole bunch of your input as of yet. Uh, is there anything you, uh, that you'd like to say as we no, hit go into to playing this one? Okay. All right. So here's the first clip that we have, and this is going to help frame the discussion. It, it also framed the entire debate between the two of them. Consider first the Kalam cosmological argument. One. If the universe began to exist, then there is a transcendent cause which brought the universe into existence. Two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore there is a transcendent cause which brought the universe into existence. Let me, let me first actually pass this over to uh, Dr. Wall because he was, he was the one that suggested using this clip to kind of use this as a, as a frame for the whole discussion. I saw your eyebrows go up, but uh, what are your thoughts? Well, I just thought since this is the syllogism that Craig is trying to uh, defend that a lot of what they're going to discuss is, is, is premise one true and is premise two true. So it seems to make sense to play this clip so that you uh, uh, know what it is they're arguing about. It wasn't really yeah. anything more complicated than that. Well, it also plays a part, and we have another clip uh, that we that we may or may not get to on God of the Gaps, and uh, and I think that's going to help sort of show that I think, and this is also another thing that may come up later on, is that there was a lot of points in the debate where they were arguing past each other. Craig was arguing for this this deductive argument, defending the premises through some of the data from cosmology, whereas Sean Carroll was wanting to completely look at the thing as explanation. So you have a theistic explanation versus a purely naturalistic explanation. And so there was a kind of like talking past each other that happened. So I, it's important to, I think, point out at the very outset what Craig, I think, was trying to do. Any more thoughts on that, Luke or Ronald? It, it's important to say that he says uh, just just a little bit later on, you know, I'm not saying that we're certain that the universe began to exist. Um, you know, it... it too many people, when they say uh, we don't know the universe began to exist, just mean they're not certain. So he's at right up front saying he's not certain that the universe began to exist. He's just saying that the, there's evidence in favor of it. That's the standard. Any thoughts, Ronald? Yeah, I, I would say that the uh, William Lane Craig has kind of resurrected this argument and, and made it famous over the last number of years. And so Sean Carroll certainly knew that this argument was coming. And, uh, and so he was prepared for it. The, um, I, I do agree with what Luke just said. I, I would kind of prefer that the argument was phrased, especially premise two, the universe uh, likely began to exist. Uh, all you really need is for the, that statement to be more likely true than not true. And I think that that really should be stated in the premise. So if I could jump in again, I just uh, want to say as well that for context, this is one, one example of the sorts of reasoning people ca- call cosmological arguments, of, of which there's actually many different examples. And this is the one version of the argument that depends most on, on time. The one You always want to say in a cosmological argument, here's a feature of the universe that shows that it's limited or not self-explanatory, and then God is the thing that explains that thing that isn't limited in that way. So this argument, the Kalam, is the one that says, well, things that come into being, that's the thing we're going to point to as saying, well, this thing needs an explanation or a cause. I thought maybe it was a little bit of a rhetorical mistake for Craig to call the transcendental cause in phrase one. Because what is this phrase, transcendental cause? Uh, Carol said later, physicists don't use that phrase in physics textbooks, but most people don't use that phrase. You know, <laughs> you don't normally say, what was the transcendental cause of the of this uh, war or something? The I think, you know, once you've... He, the thing that makes premise one intuitive if it's indeed true, is the idea that the you know anything that comes into being has a cause, 
And if that thing that comes into being is the entire universe, then it would have to transcend the universe. What else could it be? Yeah. So may, maybe, maybe the word transcendent could probably be deleted from uh, premise one without actually doing any harm here. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me mention this real quick. I'm actually hearing thunder behind me, and there's a hailstorm that's actually about to, to stroll through. So if we get disconnected and this thing completely shuts down, I apologize, but I, I don't have any control over that. So we'll, we'll see if... Uh, We'll see what happens. Uh, all right. Well, let's uh, let me play this clip. So it, I'm, I'm going to play the God of the Gaps clip, and I think that it's relevant to this first, the, the previous clip that we just played, and it's a it's a clear example of where I think Sean Carroll made a point that was completely uh, baseless. So here we go. Let's play this one. This is not to make some sort of naive claim that contemporary cosmology proves the existence of God. There is no God of the Gaps reasoning here. Rather. I'm saying that contemporary cosmology provides significant evidence in support of premises in philosophical arguments for conclusions having theological significance. It is certainly a true question, a true issue that we don't know why the early universe had a low entropy and entropy has ever been increasing. That's a good challenge for cosmology. To imagine that cosmologists cannot answer that question without somehow invoking God is a classic God of the gaps move. I know that Dr. Craig says that's not what he's doing, but then he does it. Uh, so going back to you, Aaron, so you actually wrote a blog post on this specific topic, and that's part of the reason why I included this clip here. But share some, some more of your thoughts on this God of the gaps objection, because he, he literally, he explicitly accuses Dr. Craig of doing God of the gaps. Yeah, I don't actually uh, like either of them bringing it up at some level because I think this is a very silly phrase that maybe nobody should very seldom be used. You know, people always say, oh, that's a god of the gaps, as though that were some kind of actual refutation. You could just slap a silly name onto it and then you can't believe it. If god of the gaps means there's some hole in our understanding and we appeal to God to explain that, it almost sounds like saying like inference to the best explanation is a fallacy or something like that, and I'm pretty sure it isn't. <laughs> it's true that in a theistic worldview, God sustains the entire universe, so he isn't just the cause of one or two things in the universe, he's in a certain nuanced sense the cause of every single thing in the universe, but that doesn't necessarily mean every single thing in the universe is equally good evidence of God's existence. So I feel like there's really nothing wrong with making a God of the Gaps argument, and people, theists, shouldn't be embarrassed about uh, the possibility of doing so, and atheists shouldn't throw it out as an accusation. I just feel like it's a distraction from evaluating the actual arguments. Let me steel man it real quick a little bit. So the thing that I hear most often from atheists when they raise this objection is to say something like, well, we know that, for instance, in the case of lightning, people used to attribute lightning to Thor or other gods, but now we have some some, some scientific or naturalistic explanation of, of thunder and lightning. And so we have all of these cases where naturalistic explanations have won out. And so when you invoke God in the case of the universe, you're basically just making an, uh, the same mistake. So I think that's that's what they would say in response, is that it's 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 a kind of inductive argument. Where we, we had these other cases. Yeah, go ahead. It's bad history uh, of science. It's like assuming that history jumps straight from animism to 20th century atheism. That, that's not, it's not that people believed in Thor right up to the moment of time when, uh, when uh, Benjamin Franklin flies his kite or something. <laughs> the, everyone knew 2,000 years ago, Mark philosophical... <laughs> Christians or Jews knew that uh, that the that the world operated with natural causes, and that if there was uh, something was heated up by fire, that this occurred because of natural causality. It's clear from the writings of of early church theologians that they believe just as much as we do that nature is a system in which you can explain things. That doesn't mean they had our scientific explanations today. They were much more limited, but they weren't appealing to God to explain random scientific facts as though everything in the universe were inexplicable and irrational. 
Luke, what are your thoughts on this God of the God of the Gaps objection? I'm sure you have some thoughts on it. I just want to jump on something that, that you, you said. You know, we we now have a good explanation for why thunder happens, and that that makes it a naturalistic explanation. I I, I think the word naturalistic there is wrong. I mean, it's not an explanation that assumes naturalism. It's just a natural explanation. It's just an explanation of a natural effect in terms of natural causes. I, and this, exactly the same explanation can be true on theism. And so it's not a naturalistic explanation at all. It's just a natural explanation. And and obviously, as, as Aaron just said, Christians are fine with that. Um, I, I, do, I do see something that deserves to be called the God of the Gaps reasoning within sort of Christians sometimes, uh, especially sort of lay Christians. But... Um, uh, yeah, you're quite right. I mean, it, 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 if if something is an inference to best explanation, then and and that best explanation is God, then the 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 logic, at least, you know, the argument might be a bad argument, but the logic of it is is impeccable. One of the so I'd like to say something here. Go ahead. Go ahead. One one of the issues I think with God of the gaps is um, there's a difference or a distinction made between philosophical naturalism and methodological naturalism. And I think a lot of times that's what people are trying to uh, wrestle with. And um, it's difficult, I think, for scientists sometimes to um, to look at the entire situation. So, uh, for example, uh, during the days of Isaac Newton, Robert Boyle, Robert Hooke, and, and those guys, methodological naturalism wasn't really even uh, an issue for them in terms of the, their philosophy of science. The, uh, it was quite reasonable for God to be a part of the, the explanation. And uh, I see that with the way methodological naturalism is being practiced now, uh, there is, with some scientists, absolutely no uh, room for that to happen. And I, th I think that that's a mistake. I think that um, sometimes the best explanation is God. So let me share a, a couple thoughts on this and then we'll move to the next clip. So my, my thoughts on God of the Gaps is that the, the type of reasoning that I laid out earlier, it's like, oh, well, we have all of these naturalistic explanations now of all of these things that we used to attribute to supernatural beings. And so we should, in all probability, this other thing, i.e. the universe, has a natural explanation. I think that this is guilty of, uh, of a, a kind of probabilistic theorizing called frequentism. And it wasn't until I actually learned this from Luke Barnes that I was able to apply this, this reasoning here. It seems like we have all of these, these cases, and so the frequency of finding a natural explanation is very high. And so when we look at this other thing, we should, just based on the frequencies of how often this stuff happens, we should then infer that the explanation of the universe is going to be natural or not supernatural or not God or anything like that. And so what this reasoning seems to rely on is, is a kind of probability called frequentism or theory of, of probability called frequentism. And once we acknowledge that, frequentism has some of its own problems. So one of them is called the reference class problem, which is to say, well, frequencies only happen relative to some reference class. So there's a if we uh, if we took a handful of pennies for example and started flipping them and see how often they would turn up heads or tails, we can only get a probability based on the reference class of coins in our hand. We don't necessarily have to just limit our reference class to the coins in our hands. We could limit the reference class to one coin, or even uh, broaden the reference class to all coins. And so that that's a question. How, what how do we define the reference class here? What are we referring to? And so I think there's a reference class problem when it comes to the universe and we're, we're looking at things inside the universe, like natural phenomena or like a thunder or lightning. This is something that happens inside the universe. But when it comes to the universe as a whole, that's in a different class. So we're kind of, we, we run into this reference class problem. Luke, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So I guess that, so um, Ed, Edward Fazer likes to use the example of, you know, you suppose you're cleaning a room and the way you're going to dust the room is you're going to put all the dust under the rug. Right? You sweep all the dust under the rug. Uh, and then you look and your room looks fine. Uh, and then someone says, well, you know, that method works great. It must work. It, 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 it'll work for under the rug as well, just by, you know, just by clear 
uh, extrapolation. If I can clean the rest of the room by sweeping the dust under the rug, then I can clean under the rug by sweeping the dust under the rug. No, no, hang on, that's not. <laughs> you've you've delivered. You, there's there's some sort of problem going on there. So, um, you know, there's something different about the the reality as a whole. It's trying to say that oh, science will explain that. Well. If you're a naturalist like Sean, there is a stopping point for for natural explanations, and it's got to be somewhere. And at that point, you're just done. So just just saying, as he did in the last clip, ah, oh, look, you know, eventually we'll explain it. This is just a problem for science. You now, sometimes that's not true. Sometimes, yeah. as a naturalist, there's a bottom level, and you arrive there, and all your explanations stop. All right, let's move on. Critical for that be true. Re repeat that again. last thing. It was critical for his argument that that was true. He was asserting it was true, mm -hmm. that there are some questions we shouldn't be giving answers to. Yeah, exactly. The question right. you should be asking is, what is the best model of the universe that science can come up with? By a model, I mean a formal mathematical system that purports to match on to what we observe. So if you want to know whether something is possible in cosmology or physics, you ask, can I build a model? Okay, so I played that clip a little prematurely. Why don't we do this? <laughs> Luke, why don't you uh, set that clip up for us? I'll play it again so we can kind of get some context and then we'll we'll comment on it. So this, this, I think, is one of the most crucial things that happens. It colors the rest of the whole debate. Once you understand what's happened in this clip, what happens in the rest of the debate, debate kind of falls into place. So I think this is... I've got a rant coming up here, as you can tell. <laughs> so... Uh, just give me two minutes. Do you want to play the clip again, or do you just want me to go for it? I'm going to play the clip again because, I, okay. like I said, I played it a little prematurely. So Listen here, here it is again. Very carefully. Listen very carefully. Here we go. If it will play, come on now. <laughs> oh, I'm pressing. I'm pressing the wrong button. That's what happens sometimes. All right, here we go. Now, now it'll play. The question you should be asking is, what is the best model of the universe that science can come up with? By a model, I mean a formal mathematical system that purports to match on to what we observe. So if you want to know whether something is possible in cosmology or physics, you ask, can I build a model? All right, here we go. So uh, just give me two minutes here. This is like my main point. So the question of does the universe have a beginning is not one that you can directly answer with observations. We can't, I can't point my telescope somewhere and we get an answer. So the answer has to come from theory, okay? A theory of cosmology, a, cos you know, a proper cosmological theory should answer a question like that. You know, if I have a clock here today, could this clock have ticked forever or could it only have ticked a finite number of times? That's something a theory should be able to tell you. And so the question is, which theory should we ask? And the answer that Sean says at the start is we should ask the best theory. Now, actually, I'd, I'd, I'd massage that a little bit. It, it's basically, imagine that you're sort of stood up high and there's a great big crowd below you, and that represents all the theories. And some of them are, you know, all, you know every time a new bit of information gets, you know, uh, you know, we get a new observation, some of those theories get ruled out, and so they go home. So we've got all the sort of viable theories here is this massive crowd of people. And we try to rank, rank them according to how plausible they are. So if, if, if one is, you know, requires speculative new physics, then, then it, it gets downranked a bit. And if something only uses the physics, we know it gets upranked a bit. And if something has some implausible, you know, fine tuning in its assumptions in the physics, ordinary sense of fine tuning in assumptions, it gets downranked a bit. So we've got all these theories, and we, what, what we should be doing is asking all of them at once and seeing if there's any sort of overwhelming thing. So we get on our microphone and we say, all right, on the count of three, does the universe have a beginning? One, two, three, and then everyone, all, all the theories yell back at you what their answer is. And may, maybe you know, there's like a mostly yeses and a couple of noes, in the, you know, quiet little noes in the corner, right? The, the better a theory is, the louder it shouts in this in this analogy. Um, and, you know, maybe you get a whole bunch of yeses or maybe you get a whole bunch of noes or maybe it's a complete confusion and that then that tells you that the theories don't agree with each other. So what Sean starts off with that sort of picture, we need... He talks about just the best theory. So that would be like finding the best person out there and see what they shout out. But actually, we, we more exactly, and this won't actually matter for our purposes, more exactly, we need to get everyone to shout at once. Okay, that's what we're trying to do. 
Two sentences later, Sean says, if, if you want to know whether something is possible in cosmology, in, in cosmology or physics, you ask, can I build a model? And that is a different question. Because that is the question, can anyone out there make an eternal universe? That's not, that's not asking everyone to answer. That's just trying to find one person out there, one theory out there in the landscape, which will give you an, an eternal universe. You, you see it in the way he phrases the question. We've gone from what's the best model to what's a possible model. If you want to know whether something is possible in cosmology or physics, you ask, can I build a model? But that's not the, the question is not whether it's possible. This is why it's important from the get-go that Craig says, um, I'm not saying it's certain. So if, if, if we asked all the theories and they all said yes or they all said no, then that would be great. But we've clearly got a mix out there. That was, that was, that was you know, uh, granted by Craig from the start. So the question is not, can I build a model? That's been, that's been um, conceded already. There are possible models of the universe in which it's an eternal universe. The question is, what comes back from the crowd of theories when I ask them all? And um, the reason why this is so important is because through the rest of the debate, Carol thinks if he's got a model, that's enough. Right. So later on, he says, Look, oh, I, you know, I, I had a quick search and I found 17 models in which there's a uh, you've got an, a plausible eternal universe. Now, um, in and of itself, that's just 17 isolated possibilities. What we don't know is when everyone yells out yes or no, are those 17 going to drown out the rest of the crowd? Or are those seven, you know, is that like, is, has anyone got an eternal universe out there? Oh, I can see a hand over there. I see one over, I can see 17 hands. Um, what happens when we ask all the models? This is why, and we'll get to it in a minute, it, it's, it, we have to try and ask questions of large groups of models to see what they, what they tell us. But once you've understood this point, a lot of, a lot of Carol's points about uh, what models are available, what's true of certain models, a lot of the times when he tries to say it doesn't matter whether this is speculative, when he says of the multiverse, oh, this will just help us uh, choose between multiverse models, all we need is a model. The, the methodology is wrong, and it's changed over the course of those three sentences. He starts off by saying, what's the best model? That's the right question. The model is a mathematical system. One, you know, Two sentences later, oh, it, it, the question is, what's possible within cosmology? Now, that's not enough. If we're trying to just scientifically answer the question does the universe have a beginning it's not enough to ask are there some models out there in which the universe doesn't have a beginning that's my All right answer. let me let me try to break this down a little bit because I, I noticed in the live chat some people were falling off here um so what what luke has just explained is he was basically going through piece by piece the clip that we just played so if you weren't listening carefully and if you didn't listen to it or read it like we are it's it can be difficult to see what was going on just now but basically in the, in the clip that we just played Sean Carroll says, he asked the question, what is the best, the, that's, that's key right here, what is the best model of the universe that science can come up with? He says, that's the question you should be asking. But then literally two sentences later in the clip we just played, he says, so if you want to know whether something is possible in cosmology or physics, you ask, can I build a model? And Luke is pointing out that possibility is not the relevant question. The relevant question is the one that he asked at the very beginning, what is the best model of the universe that science can come up with? Does that help clarify? Yep, bingo. Okay. Uh, Aaron, what are your thoughts here? I actually had a little bit of a different interpretation of those words of Carol than I think Luke did. I interpreted Carol as making more of a metaphysical point than a point about how we should select models. That is, I interpreted him as saying not that he's necessarily going to favor the models that are eternal, but that once he finds the model, the when he says, in order to know what's possible, you just ask, is there a model? I took this to be as a piece of his saying that he thinks asking for a cause of the universe is the wrong question to ask. That is, I believe that Carol wants to defend a very restricted view of causality, where once you have a mathematical description of the universe, a 
uh, a, a sort of, you, you write it as what he called a differential equation. You show what pattern it conforms to. And it's a little ironic, given how he disses Aristotle at some point in the debate. But I think he means exactly what Aristotle would have called the formal cause, the, the form or shape <laughs> of the thing. He says, once you specify that, there's no other questions to, to answer. That, that you don't you don't ask about where did it come from why is it that way you've just described it and that's all you can do as he says you go home that that's it um, I don't agree with that restricted view of causation but that was what I took him to be trying to communicate with that quote yeah so yes. I think that's certainly his his method uh, but it, it, as you look through the debate the difference between these two approaches, it flows through the whole thing. Um, he's, he's not, in particular, and we'll get to this in a section, he, he tries to privilege models over theorems. Um, and we'll get, we'll get to that in a minute. But I, th I think that's a mistake for exactly this level. The question is we need to try and survey all the models and say, you know, th this is a standard thing within probability. You try to, it's called marginalize over your uncertainty. So, you know, we don't know which of these models is the right one. We have to need to ask all of them, putting appropriate weight on the ones that are more you know, plausible. So they, they shout louder. But, yeah, yeah, you're certainly right. There's, there's, <laughs> there's more than one thing going on in this quote, I think. That's, that's right, it's all a question of whether you read him as defending premise one or premise two. If he's defending yeah. premise two, that the universe, uh, arguing that the universe didn't have a cause, then the fact that there's merely a model while showing it's likely that, that this is how it works, I think you're, you're, that's where your interpretation would come in. Yeah, I guess I was reading it more in light of his denial of premise one. Ronald, that, do you that, have any other... Universe, if the universe uh, came into being, it has a cost. Ronald, do you have any additional thoughts here? Uh, otherwise, I'm going to move on to the, to the next clip. No, let's move on to the next thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the next thing is naturalism versus theism. Any any comments on this, Luke, before I play it? Yeah, so once again, um, we start with the right question and then very quickly it gets substituted out for the wrong question. Uh, or you know, the right approach and then you know suddenly the wrong approach comes in uh, as well. So, uh, by the way, um, I'm not saying there's anything nefarious here. I, don't, I'm, I, I, you know, I, I actually think Sh Sean is trying to get at truth. So I don't think that's I, that, that's what's going on here. But I'm just saying that, that this is an inconsistency in his approach. And it comes down to a conflict between two major fundamental pictures of the world, what philosophers would call ontologies, naturalism and theism. Naturalism says that all that exists is one world, the natural world, obeying laws of nature, which science can help us discover. Theism says that in addition to the natural world, there is something else, at the very least God, perhaps there are other things as well. I want to argue that naturalism is far and away the winner when it comes to cosmological explanation. Meanwhile, theism, I would argue, is not a serious cosmological model. That's because cosmology is a mature subject. We care about more things than just creating the universe. We care about specific details. At the cosmology conferences, we're discussing these questions that you see before you. I'm not going to list all of them, but a real cosmological model wants to predict what is the amount of density perturbation in the universe and so forth. Theism does not even try to do this because ultimately theism is not well defined. Oh, I got another rant coming on here. If you want to hear it, yes, right. I do. Let, let, let me. Let me. Okay. So we started off. No, note, there was a gap in the middle there. There were two clips. They're relevant to each other, but they weren't at the same place in the debate. They're about eight minutes apart. Anyway. So in the first clip, that's all fine. It's. 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 We've got two worldviews. We've got theism. We've got naturalism. And the question is, which one does a better job when it comes to explaining the world we see? That's all great. And then. In the second clip, which we saw, you know, meanwhile, theism is not a serious cosmological model is where that one started. He's now comparing theism not to naturalism, but to scientific models. Mm -hmm. And this is a problem, right? So the question is what, whether, whether a scientific model can answer all the questions he put on the screen there, like what are the dense, what, what's the amount of density perturbation in the universe, right? He just said in the first question, 
in, in the first quote, naturalism says that in addition to the natural world, there is something else, at very least, God. So in any, theism. any, yeah, in, sorry, in theism, thank you. In any theistic worldview, I can have, I can have any sign, you know, I can have the scientific models I want in there as well. Okay, so here's here's where it, it really comes to point. If you start comparing, we're supposed to be comparing theism with naturalism. So the question is not can theism answer those questions, or to be more exact, if you want to be fair, the question is, it, you know, if you expect theism to answer questions like what is the density, you know, perturbations in the universe. The next thing you should be asking is, according to naturalism, what are the density perturbations mm -hmm. in the universe? Right. So that's where you see, okay, all right, no, no cosmological models. Okay, if you can invoke a cosmological model, so can I. And, and you'll, you'll predict density per perturbations, and so will I, and we'll have a wonderful time doing it. If you're doing this properly, as he set up in the first clip, right, take naturalism... And only naturalism and predict the density perturbations in the universe. And if Sean can do that, then then we can make that comparison. But otherwise, he's simply, you know, there's a shift there. The right question got substituted for a similar sounding, but totally different question. We're supposed to be comparing worldviews, theism and naturalism, not theism with a scientific model, which is a totally different thing. So once you see that, along with the, these are the two strategies that make it look like Sean's doing more work than he is, uh, or, or Sean's getting the better of it. That that he's he he's sort of substituted, and all I have to worry about is possibilities. No, and he's set up a, an unrealistic and uh, uh, un, uh, un irrational um, uh, uh, competition between not between theism and naturalism, which is what he said he'd do, but between theism and specific scientific models. Aaron, I feel like you're going to disagree again. Am I wrong? No, actually, I uh, when I I was having difficulty placing my finger when I was on on what I felt was sort of wrong with what Sean Carroll was saying when I was writing my own blog post on this, and when I actually read Luke's blog post on it, I thought it was an absolutely devastating criticism of what uh, Carroll was doing here because Carroll is effectively giving naturalism credit. For everything any scientific model does, if it turns out to be the right scientific model, even if that scientific model could also be believed in on theism. If you just say, I believe in naturalism, what can I deduce from that? Well, arguably there's something. Arguably you should be able to deduce from that that there is a valid scientific model to describe the universe. And maybe that gives you some mileage, seeing that that seems to be the correct. correct but at least as far as we can tell in many places. But you certainly don't get credit for uh, all the things predicted by some specific model because naturalism simply doesn't tell you which model to pick, except in some rare and specific context involving fine tuning where it tells you the wrong answer. <laughs> uh, Cameron, so I'd like to, I'd like to jump in here. Um, I think Luke is exactly right. And I think uh, I'm coming to this uh, debate from a perspective of philosophy of science and the history of philosophy of science. And um, I want to point out that without Christianity, without theism, we never would have had the scientific revolution. All of the people from Galileo, Kepler, Newton, Boyle, all of them were uh, devout believers. And they were driven in part, at least, in their study of the universe because they wanted to, to know the Creator better. And Psalm 19, uh, verses 1 to 4, specifically commends the study of nature. It commends astronomy, studying the night's uh, sky. And um, the Belgic Confession talks about the two books of Revelation, the general book of Revelation, which is nature, and the specific book of Revelation, which is the Bible. And so scientists, um, going back from a long period of time, uh, many of them have been driven by this desire to know the Creator better, and so they they wanted to study the creation. And I mean, you just can't yeah, say. Yeah, you could say maybe science is. But go ahead, Aaron, please. Well, maybe you could say, uh, following this, a lot of a lot of. Uh, 
uh, people, uh, philosophers of science like to argue science is methodologically naturalist, that even if you can be a theist and do science, but you have to pretend naturalism is true while you're doing it. Maybe it would be uh, equally true to say science is methodologically theist. Anytime you do science, you can you you're, you're implicitly thinking of the universe when you describe the universe by equations you're implicitly thinking of the universe as though it were a thought in a mind exactly. as though it were a thought in a mind that's intelligent enough to calculate everything in the whole universe and you say me with my little mind i'm somehow treating myself as if I could have a thought in my mind that's the same uh, that that describes the whole universe as if it were in a mind even though so it's obviously not really in my mind. From that perspective, uh, you could say science maybe is methodologically theist, which doesn't mean to, to imitate the other argument. It doesn't actually believe to do science. As long as you're willing to suspend your belief and behave as if there were a God, you can still do <laughs> science just fine. <laughs> Very I good. Like yeah. So I, I wanted to uh, let you guys know, as you can hear here, we're not just doing like a review of all of the arguments. Did Craig respond to all of this? Did, did Carol respond to all of Craig's arguments? We're kind of looking at some of the points that were made and looking at whether or not they hold up. So it's a it's a more broadly, I don't, I don't know what you want to call it, but it's not just looking at all of the points back and forth, which we are going to do that. And we have some more clips queued up here where we're going to look at their back and forth and everything. But we're we're looking at some of the points that Carol made and uh, asking the question, does it really hold up once we actually look into it. So uh, I also wanted to mention if you guys are enjoying this so far, then hit the subscribe button on the on the channel and turn on the little bell so you can get notifications when we post new videos. If you're enjoying this type of content, subscribing is one of the best ways, the easiest ways. It's also free that you can support this ministry. So uh, with that said, are there any other thoughts before we move on to the next clip here? Model versus reality? No, okay. I think we're done. Okay, cool. Uh, Luke, would you like to set this one up as well? Um, yeah, so this is, this is really interesting. This is one of the ones where I think actually, uh, Craig did have a pretty good answer to this. Um, so, uh, it, it's a question of, um, you know, scientific models don't refer to trans transcendent causes or to anything outside the universe or anything like that. So what should we conclude from that fact? And that's, that's the topic. All right. So here it is. Can I build a model where the universe had a beginning but did not have a cause? The answer is yes, it's been done. 30 years ago, very famously, Stephen Hawking and Jim Hartle presented the no-boundary quantum cosmology model. The point about this model is not that it's the right model. I don't think that we're anywhere near the right model yet. The point is that it is completely self-contained. It is an entire history of the universe which does not rely on anything outside. It just is like that. The demand for more then a complete and consistent model that fits the data is a relic of a pre-scientific view of the world. My claim is that if you had a perfect cosmological model that accounted for the data, you would go home and declare yourself having been victorious. Dr. Carroll says, but on the hartle hawking model, the universe is uncaused. Not at all. Such a model comes into being, or rather the universe comes into being on such a model, and there's nothing in the theory that would explain why that universe exists rather than not. Um, the model may be self-contained, but that's perfectly consistent with my arguments. I'm not arguing for some kind of interventionist deity, but rather why does the universe exist? Why did it come into being at all? Luke, go ahead. Okay, so uh, first of all, can you, do you, you see the point of why he's focusing on models and why that makes a difference? I mean, he, he, he says things like, you know, it, it's not a question of whether this is the right model, it's just whether it's, it's possible. So the question we were supposed to be asking about, what's the, what, where does the evidence point? What, what do I get when I ask the models as a, as a group, what do you say, is, has now been replaced with, can I find anyone who says the universe, you know, has a, you know, in this case, it has a beginning but does not have a cause. Anyway, moving past that point, um, Carol says it's it's this model is self-contained. It doesn't so therefore it doesn't rely on anything outside. And all I want to point out is that that's making a jump. It's making a jump from this model doesn't refer to anything outside itself to therefore the reality it represents doesn't rely on anything outside itself. And that's not the same thing. So. So Hume 
has this, you know, there's a famous answer to Hume from Elizabeth Anscombe. So Hume said, look, I can imagine something um, happening without any, without any cause. Therefore, causes aren't sort of necessary in the world, you know. Well, however you want to phrase that, but someone who knows Hume could do that more yeah. exactly. And what Hume, what, what Anscombe said in reply was, just because you can imagine an effect without a cause, you know, all, that, that doesn't mean that there can actually be an effect without a cause. And so in this model, the fact, the fact that you can create this self-consistent story without a, a, any sort of cause outside, it does not mean there is no sort of cause outside. That's a separate point. And so that's the point Craig's making. You know, it, it, it doesn't answer the question of why the universe exists at all. Why does this model exist? And so th the idea that this is totally self-contained, this is the point Aaron was making. Self-contained model therefore means you don't have to ask any questions about where, any deeper questions about where it came from. Right. Yeah, I was going to make the same connection here. It sounds like he, it sounds like what he's most interested in is formal causation. Aaron, are you there? Uh, yes, yes, I'm there. The, the mathematical description, and he doesn't think there's anything left after that. I feel I feel since since Carol mentioned the Harlow Hawking proposal, maybe it falls to me as the person doing quantum gravity to actually <laughs> give people a clue about what that actually is. Um, hopefully and not too technical. The usual way you set up classical physics is you actually have to specify two things. You have to specify the initial conditions and you have to specify the laws of physics. The laws of physics don't tell you what the initial conditions are. They just tell you if you specify the initial conditions, what they evolve to as time goes on. So from that perspective, physics involves sort of two separate inputs, the laws and the initial conditions. What, what Jim Hartle and Stephen Hawking did is they came up with an idea that in a sense unifies these two inputs with each other, where if you know the laws of physics, there's a mathematical expression they use which mathematically involves this bizarre notion of taking time to imaginary values in the sense of complex numbers square roots of minus one, so that's a little uh, uh, funky, but th the point is they wrote down a prescription where if you have the laws of physics, they have a proposal for what the initial conditions are that depends on, uh, that is in some sense uh, picked out by those laws. So it's a very interesting idea from a scientific point of view because it unifies what we're used to thinking as two separate inputs. Uh, that doesn't mean that, as Carol says, that's necessarily the correct model. In fact, last I checked, it seems to give wrong predictions about what the universe should, should predict a big, empty universe rather than an inflationary scenario. Um, maybe more interesting from a philosophical point of view is, I, I think Craig is right, that doesn't really say, give an explanation for why there's a universe rather than not a universe. The the uh, um, you know you'd have to believe if these two things are unified you'd have to believe that the source of the laws of physics and the source of the initial conditions is somehow the same thing but uh, last I checked that is what I believe as as a theist so <laughs> Ronald do you have any thoughts on this one so it at the end of Hawking's book where he talks about his no boundary proposal the Hartle Hawking um, proposal. He talks about, um, he asks the question, what gives fire to the equations? But I never really ans I never really heard Hawking's answer to that question. If he gave it, I must have missed it. So there has to be something to give fire to these equations, right? What is that? Hmm. I think that's a quote from Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler, who wrote a famous GR textbook where they also engaged in a lot of philosophical uh, uh, speculation and description. Is that in Misner, Thorne, Thorn and Wheeler? Ah. I think it's in Misner, Thorne, and it's Wheeler. It's in the phone book. There you go. I didn't know that. Cool. They say you write a bunch of, imagine writing a bunch of equations out on the floor, like one equation for each of the tiles on, on your kitchen or something. And then they say, you, you know, you stand over them and you say, you say, go, become a universe. And <laughs> one of them will become universes, at least not that you can see. So the, the question is, is why, why when there's so many different laws you can pick, what is it that makes 
the laws we have, what is it that makes there be an actual, an actual there there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so in the next. So oh, go ahead. Um, just just quickly, the 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 statement that's crucial there is if I have a self-contained model, then I don't need anything else. That statement comes from naturalism, not from the science. Okay, that's that's pure naturalism. On theism, the fact that you've got a self-contained mathematical model of the universe just says that the universe is a law, you know, a law, rational, law-abiding kind of place. That yeah. uh, that doesn't mean it's self-contained. And so the the physics, the equations stay the same. It's the philosophy we put on top that that, or or you put underneath to be to be you know, more precise, maybe that that makes the difference there. To draw this back to, to the quote from Craig, he says, the model may be self-contained, but that is perfectly consistent with my argument. So, uh, okay, well, let's let's move on to the, the next clip, testing versus retconning. And yeah, it looks yeah. like uh, this this is where we're going to hit Boltzmann brain, and, and we can spend a little time on that. But uh, any setup on this one, Luke? Um, no, just play it, and I'll, I'll, I'll give my little spiel afterwards. Okay. The multiverse doesn't say that everything that can possibly happen happens with equal probability. It says that there's a definite history of the multiverse and you can make predictions. Different multiverse models will have different ratios of ordinary observers to random observers. That's a good thing. That helps us distinguish between viable models of the multiverse and non-viable models. And there are plenty of viable models where the Boltzmann brain or random fluctuations do not dominate. Let me ask this real quick as you set this up. Are you aware of any of like multiple viable models where the Boltzmann brain problem is not a problem or they, they do not dominate? Is he, it, it sounds like it, well, uh, it's possible that he's going beyond what other experts would agree with. Yeah, he, he plays a bit fast. And at some point in, in the debate, he says there is a an easy and, and I forget exactly what he says, something like an easy and natural solution to the fine-tuning problem within naturalism, which is the multiverse. I was like, easy? Are you kidding me? <laughs> um, so as I look over the scientific literature, and again, you know, th that's a, it's a hard thing to, to take it all in. It, it's I, I find a very confused literature. I find an awful lot of toy models, like very oversimplified models of the multiverse. And, um, yeah, it, it, I, I'm not sure about that statement at all. So let me just quickly get back. There's a, there's a, um, th there's a point going back to the thing about models. So I, I, I call this ret – I've heard this called retconning. There's a, there's a nice paper by – I heard this term from David Manley, who's a, who's a philosopher. He got a very good critique, actually, of the fine-tuning argument, which you can go and find. Um, retconning is it's actually a term from like comic books and movies where a, a later movie goes back and changes how you interpret an earlier movie so for example uh, i think the earliest example is sherlock holmes at the end of one of them he dies or the most in, the most obvious way to read the book is that he dies and then uh, arthur conan doyle was like oh hang on i don't want that so the later one explains how actually it just he faked his death and so it it it, it you know so this idea of um, retconning, as, as Manly uses it, I love this term, is just when you get new information, you, can, you have a choice. You can either throw away the theory that it seems to contradict, or you can just modify the theory. And retconning is where you modify the theory and you forget about the fact that actually your theory has to take a hit. It's supposed to take a probability hit when you do something like this. And so um, when Carol says... Um, Different, you know, some multiverse models have a Boltzmann brain problem. Some of them don't. That helps us choose between the models. That's true as long as you're convinced for some reason that a multiverse model has to be correct. But if, you know, if, if you, again, collect all your models out on your crowd and you say, all right, okay, um, thanks for all coming here. Um, by the way, if you've got a Boltzmann brain problem, we don't need you anymore. Go home. Okay, if like 99.9% .9 of your models go home and you're left with like three left <laughs> in the corner, right? That's a problem, but your mul the multiverse hypothesis should have taken a hit there. So just sort of retconning and saying, oh, oh, I wasn't interested in Bolton Brain multiverse models anyway. I, who cares about those guys? No, 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 that, that's got to take a hit. So saying there are plenty of viable models doesn't tell us whether... You know, again, that's a, is anyone out there not having a Boltzmann brain problem? Okay, I've got a couple. I can see one over there. Um, 
that doesn't tell us if I look at the total space of them, whether multiverse models uh, do any well as a group together, which would then tell us whether there is a multiverse. Uh, let's, let's turn to you, Aaron. What are your thoughts on what he said? So uh, the Boltzmann brain issue is actually an area where I thought that both of the debaters um, gave statements that were a bit misleading. Um, so Craig made it sound like made it sound like the Boltzmann brain problem was just a a, a generic feature of the multiverse. I think what Craig was correct so far. Sorry, Carol was correct so far as it goes to point out that there's a lot of model dependence in that statement. And I've certainly seen abstracts of physics papers on the archive where they're trying to argue, oh, here's a way of doing cosmology that doesn't have the Boltzmann brain problem. But there's a more serious problem that he just didn't mention at all. He said, well, this is, he acted as though this was a completely well-defined, straightforward question. You just check your model, calculate the probabilities, and that's extremely far from being true. And the reason, uh, one of the reasons has something to do with what's called the measure problem in cosmology. But the biggest issue is that most of these multiverse scenarios actually create a multiverse that's infinitely big, uh, if for no other reason than that the universe keeps going forever, nucleating new regions with different laws of physics and so on. So if you try to do a survey to say what are the odds that somebody in this universe has perception lives in a universe that looks like ours, conditional on them being conscious or observers or having brains or whatever you want to do, you're going to pretty much always find if you do this as a fraction, you want to say, well, what's the fraction? Uh, what's the, the denominator of the fraction is all the observers. The numerator is how many see something like me. Or uh, so... One way, one naive way of handling probability theory is to say, what's that fraction? The trouble is, if the universe is infinitely big, then the numerator is infinity and the denominator is infinity. And infinity over infinity does not, in fact, have a mathematically well defined uh, uh, answer. So, the another way you could approach the subject is you could say, well, some people think you should reason by saying, well, what are the odds? It's, oh, the theory is confirmed if anybody anywhere in the multiverse sees something like me. The trouble with that, again, in an infinitely big universe, that probability is probably going to be one, if anything, buddy, could be like, like uh, anybody anywhere counts as confirming the theory if they see what I see. So the fact is, I don't actually know any sensible way of reasoning about probability theory in the multiverse that does not lead to horrible paradoxes. So it's not like you can just read off these probability measures without making a bunch of highly ad hoc and difficult to motivate assumptions about how to even do probability theory in the first place. Now, I mean, that's very confusing, especially because it seems excessively dogmatic to say I'm certain there's no multiverse. So there has to be some right way of reasoning if there, it's true that there's a multiverse, I guess. But I've never seen anybody actually lay out a convincing and non-paradoxical way of doing so. So that leaves me stumped to say I actually don't know how to evaluate the probability of observations given the multiverse. And... At the very least, that means I'm not in a position to say the multiverse definitely wins in terms of its predictions. Okay, so I actually need an interpreter for what Aaron just said. Luke, <laughs> can you can you interpret what he just said for me and for the audience? Oh, oh, look. Usually, when we do probabilities, you know, you know uh, often we're in a scenario where we're just counting things. So I flip fifty coins. How many of them turned up heads? You know. It, the problem is if I flip an infinite number of coins and say how many turned up heads, it's infinity over infinity. Um, and so doing probabilities where there are infinities floating around is is at least non-trivial and possibly not uh, not not possible at all. And so mm. what, what you know, Aaron saying just you know oh, there's an awful lot of multiverse models where there's infinities flying all over the place. And so saying something like we can make a prediction about um, how many observers in the universe, ha you know, are, are like me who have, you know, have, uh, you know, proper proper senses and a proper understanding of the world around them, and how many are just 
a Boltzmann brains, isolated brains that are, are, are wrong about the universe around them. They just had a brain that fluctuates out of nowhere. Actually, if if the answer to that's infinity over infinity, you got real troubles. Uh, and so, yeah, it, 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 it's it's not at all clear that there are <laughs> that there are there are multiverse models that that overcome this. Let alone plenty of viable models. Well, there's plenty of planes. The paradoxical yeah. thing is, even when you fully specified the model, or you think it can still be completely non-obvious how you would calculate probabilities. Yeah. So from that point of view, Carol was was uh, not mentioning an elephant in the room that uh, that uh, is a very live issue of discussion amongst uh, cosmologists, by the way. Okay, let's move on to the next clip. We have, uh, we're on uh, clip number six and we have 10 to get through. So, uh, and we do want to take some Q&A. So if you have a question for any of my guests, then hold it in your mind right now, unless you want to send it as a super chat. Uh, I'll be able to go back and scroll through and find those really easily. But uh, if you have a question for, for one of my guests, we're going to get to them as quickly as we can, but let's get through some more of these clips. And so this one is on theorems versus models. And so uh, I'll just go ahead and play this one and then we'll get thoughts from Luke. If you need to invoke a theorem, because that's what you like to do, rather than building models, I would suggest the quantum eternity theorem. If you have a universe that obeys the conventional rules of quantum mechanics, has a non-zero energy, and the individual laws of physics are themselves not changing with time, that universe is necessarily eternal. Okay, so this, uh, uh, well, okay. yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I want to sort of unleash Aaron on the quantum eternity theorem in one second. But um, just notice that first sentence there. If you want to invoke a theorem, because that's what you like to do rather than building models. Okay, that's a that's the mistake. That's the model versus theorem mistake. You know, I, I just need a model mistake coming to roost. Okay, um, the, the first of all, it's completely baffling to me. The theorems are theorems about models. They're not two separate things. And especially given our setup, we've got to try and take a poll of all the models because they're the only ones that can tell us where, you know, scientifically whether there's a beginning or not. The theorems are precisely a way of getting a whole bunch of models to answer at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so we get some sort of idea about, okay, there's those models over there that rely on general relativity. They have a gravity which is always attractive. There's an energy condition. These are the classic model all of those ones say the universe had a beginning okay that's something i can say about a group of models that's not nothing maybe there's a bigger group over here that says the opposite and so they will drown them out when everyone shouts but the to dismiss the models like that is just so confusing because uh, so the theorems sorry because the theorems are theorems about broad classes of models I and mean, that's what we're supposed to be asking about what do we get when we survey the whole thing um on top of that, I don't put. I think the quantum eternity theorem is kind of nothing. I mean, in order to say something about the beginning of time, a theorem has to treat time. Uh, the 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 theory, you know, in this case, the not just a specific model, but the theory has to treat time as a dynamic thing. So general relativity can say time has a beginning because it treats time as a as a dynamic thing that could have a boundary and all of that. Whereas it seems to me in quantum mechanics, you know, it it assumes time is eternal from the get go. So it's hardly a theorem. But I'll hand over to Aaron, who knows much more about these. Uh, yeah, before, well, well, before exactly Aaron, before that. you come in real quick, I want to yeah. actually get it. Ronald, do you have thoughts on this? Um, I do. There's. Um, I, I'd be happy to talk after Aaron, though. Let's, let's let Aaron speak first. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, I think it's, it is indeed a profound change of general relativity that time becomes part of the dynamics of the system, that we don't treat it as just a, uh, something that is just a stage that doesn't interact with the actors. We treat it as something that is itself uh, can be distorted, is affected by gravity. For example, time goes a little bit slower near the surface of the Earth, and believe it or not, that's actually why you fall down. The, so, <laughs> so in, uh, it's true, it's true. Yeah, that's good, um, I like that. The, uh, it's uh, so Carol has this odd uh, uh, statement in his fine print of of this theorem 
that where he says if the universe has non-zero energy and presumably he means that because if the universe has zero energy then this wave function doesn't evolve at all and time isn't even a dimension and you have to think about time some other way well what carol uh somehow uh neglected to mention is that in the standard uh, equations of general relativity for a closed cosmology. And by closed, I mean it's not like a star sitting in an infinite universe. I mean it's a universe that wraps around on itself and has no boundary like like a big hypersphere or something. Uh, There's not an edge of the universe that you can get to and say, okay, here's the edge of the universe, like Ptolemy thought the sphere of fixed stars were. So usually in cosmology, we assume there's no spatial boundary. And in general relativity, the equations of general relativity, one of the most important equations of the so-called ADM formulation of general relativity is that the energy of the universe is zero. The energy density is zero, understood in a particular definition of the energy, the Hamiltonian, which is in fact the exact definition of the energy that he's alluding to in this quantum eternity theorem. So somehow he uh, uh, forgot to mention that the uh, most conservative assumption you could possibly make that uh, quantum gravity works the same way as classical general relativity, in which case this equation is actually called the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. H psi equals zero is the equation. It just says the energy acting on the wave function of the universe is zero. Uh, the energy is zero in cosmology. That actually encodes the statement in the theory that time is a sort of arbitrary choice of coordinate parameterization and it doesn't you could uh you could you could use whatever time coordinates you like so it's kind of a funny thing that he's alluding to a theorem that is almost certainly doesn't actually apply to quantum cosmology here now i mean it might apply in some uh idiosyncratic model he's 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 written about we all have our own our own uh, idiosyncratic ideas about how things should go, but but it's certainly the 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 standard wisdom about quantum cosmology that the energy of the universe should be zero. Okay, let me jump in here at, at this point. So as Aaron is talking about the energy of the universe being zero, um, I think more precisely for for people who are not cosmologists and aren't used to that phraseology, what he's what he really means is that the, the net energy of the universe is zero because the positive energy is offset by the negative um, energy of gravity. Is that right, Aaron? Is that yeah. my understanding of correct? Yes. Okay. So that just so that that doesn't confuse anybody, uh, it's the net energy, energy is zero. So the thing about the quantum energy, or, um, excuse me, the quantum eternity theorem that that Carol is talking about here was I was – astounded when he made that um, statement. And so I immediately went to uh, Google Scholar and searched the term quantum eternity theorem. Guess what? It doesn't appear in the literature at all until after this debate. He kind of invented that term. And then in the um, in Carroll's post-debate uh, musings, which he put on his blog, he uh, he talked about the quantum eternity theorem and a paper that he had written. And so when I looked at that paper, I expected to find a paper that was really going to define and and uh, um, prove out this theorem in a mathematical sense. And it really wasn't what I found at all. The paper that he alluded to was a paper um, called "What it is, is What If Time Is Real?" or, or something like that. He's arguing for the reality of time, which I'm in favor of, but it was a uh, it was not at all what I was expecting in terms of a a paper proving a theorem. That, that's really not what the paper was about. And so I, I just I felt like um, he was assuming something that is common within quantum mechanics and trying to make it into something that it. Uh, bigger than it really is. Luke, what are, what are your thoughts here? 
No, I, I defer to Aaron's expertise when it comes to the specifics of this theorem. It's, it's um, yeah, it, for, for me, it, it just, to put that up against the singularity theorems and the BGV theorems is something is which e equally deserving of our attention just doesn't seem to be, to be right at all. Um, I, it seems to me this is why he's trying to downgrade the importance of the theorems, for me, completely irrationally, is because the ones that say there's a beginning are, are very surprising and very powerful and very general, and the one that says there isn't doesn't seem to hold, as, as Aaron was explaining, doesn't seem to hold in our universe at all. Or, or and, and for me, you know, even if it did, doesn't hold a lot of weight just because... You know, it, it's not a theory that treats time dynamically anyway. Yeah, I, I think it's a lot bombastic to even call it a theorem, which doesn't mean he isn't in some sense technically it right. It is true. That it could be the conclusion of certain premises, but in a way that's almost trivial, it almost follows immediately. It's probably better to call it not the quantum eternity theorem, but something more like definition of the energy. <laughs> the energy tells you how the wave function of the universe changes with stuff. So, That's just to be clear, it, it is true. He's not making something up. It's a, it, no. it, it is a theorem. No. Um, he's had Within to, the formulation of yeah. quantum mechanics, when there is this absolute time parameter, yes, it's absolutely true. Yeah. But if or, you, it's true within our models anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but if you define a theorem as something that helps you to assess um, models, whether it, it's going to help you rule some out or, or privilege others. Um, I don't see his quantum eternity theorem doing that in terms of, of uh, helping us decide whether the universe, uh, a universe model that is past eternal is more likely to be true than a, a cosmological model that has a beginning. I don't see that theorem having anything at all to say about the validity of these two models. I guess it's a question, you know, quantum cosmology, we're trying to bring in assumptions from gravity, bring in assumptions from quantum mechanics. Yeah. There's a question of what assumption you should prioritize. If you pick that one assumption and prioritize it over everything else, well, it doesn't agree with the standard way of quantizing gravity, but the, the standard wisdom. But I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. It's, 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 uh, it, it doesn't really, it applies to... He seems to be thinking of a model of his own rather than, uh, yeah. or, or, or rather than the standard way of doing quantum cosmology. Yeah, so there's nothing in the quantum eternity theorem that really would um, rule out a model that says the multiverse had a beginning. No. Yeah. All right, well, let's move on to uh, we, the Bordet. Is it Bordet? Bordet? I'm terrible pronouncing pretty much every name, but is that I've is that the way? I've heard both Bord and Bordet, so I'm not sure what it is. All right, I'm just going to butcher it. Bordet Guth Velinkin, and so that was mentioned by Luke. I'm and afraid I the, had no idea either. <laughs> okay, I well, it was Bord, but maybe I'm wrong. I've heard. I think Bordet comes from something I heard Craig, and Craig is like amazing with pronunciation. So. That, that may have been where I got that from. Anyways, that's that's beside the point. We're about to play a clip about the bordet guth vilenkin theorem, and then we'll uh, we'll get some thoughts after we play the clip. So here we go. The bord guth vilenkin theorem proves that classical space-time, under a single very general condition, cannot be extended to past infinity, but must reach a boundary at some time in the finite past. Now, Either there was something on the other side of that boundary or not. If not, then that boundary is the beginning of the universe. If there was something on the other side, then it will be a non-classical region described by the yet-to-be-discovered theory of quantum gravity. In that case, Vilenkin says, it will be the beginning of the universe. So I'd like to talk about the bordet guth vilenkin theorem, since Dr. Craig emphasizes it. And the rough translation is that in some universes, not all, the space-time description that we have as a classical space-time breaks down at some point in the past. Where Dr. Craig says that the bordet guth vilenkin theorem implies the universe had a beginning, that is false. That is not what it says. What it says is that our ability to describe the universe classically 
that is to say not including the effects of quantum mechanics, gives out. That may be because there's a beginning, or it may be because the universe is eternal, either because the assumptions of the theorem are violated or because quantum mechanics becomes important. So uh, interesting. We heard both iterations right there. Well, uh, Luke, take it away. <laughs> they were the wrong way around. <laughs> Craig said Bored and, and Carol said Bordet. Anyway, well, I'm, I'm going to go with Bordet. Um, all I want to point out here, there's a lot to say about this, that, that Craig says that the theorem proves that classical space-time under a single very general condition cannot be extended to past infinity but must reach a boundary at some point in the past. And then Carol says, based in the clips, which we've spliced together, of course, but when he comes to address that, Carol says basically the same thing and then says Dr. Craig is, is wrong. So the, the point that Craig... So what, what Carol says is... Um, in some universes, not all, there's the very, very general condition. Classical space-time, uh, that, that's what Craig said. It's about classical space-time. Breaks down at some point in the past. And Craig says, must reach a boundary at some point in the finite past. If, as far as the theorem goes, they actually say the same thing. What Craig then does is to say, all right, what... the it, it, what happens at this breakdown point, and he says that that is basically a beginning of the universe, whereas what Carol says is, no, uh, we, can't, we can't say that's a beginning of the universe, or perhaps in the real universe that theorem is violated. But all of that is not a disagreement about the bordet guth vilenkin theorem. It's a disagreement about what its implications are. And in particular, Craig's got this extra argument, and this is where they didn't quite match each other. They didn't quite get at this. The, the extra argument from Craig is, Okay, uh, we go back, we reach a boundary, as he showed in that diagram. Then we're in a, in, you know, if that's the beginning, that's the beginning, and we're done. Otherwise, there's a quantum region, and what he says is it's, 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 he's got an extra argument saying you can't have an eternal quantum system because it's unstable. Why wouldn't it have transitioned into our universe earlier, or something like that? But it's that extra argument where they disagree, not, not Borde Guth Vilenkin. Yeah, and I think that's actually the part where he cites Aaron's work. Is that correct? Uh, I don't recall, but maybe. <laughs> the, so at some point, when he's talking about whether the singularity theorems can be applied, my work was more related to the Tenno singularity theorem than to the BGV theorem. Do you have any additional thoughts on this, uh, this clip here? I have uh, some thoughts on this. To me, this, this clip is really the crux of the debate. And um, I, feel, I feel pretty strongly about this whole thing, the way that it comes down. In, in the blog post that I wrote, I talked about Sean Carroll's dishonesty. And I, when I watched this, I was absolutely shocked by uh, Carroll's denial that the BGV theorem implies that the universe had a beginning. I think I was probably as shocked about this as Alexander Vilenkin would have been shocked about it. Um, and I, <clears throat> if you, because I've read the, uh, the theorem and I've read about the theorem, I've read Vilenkin's book, and let me just read uh, a couple of things here. This is from Vilenkin's book, and he writes, it's said that an argument is what convinces reasonable men and a proof is what it takes to convince even an unreasonable man. With the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Now, I mean, it's possible for cosmologists to disagree with Lincoln's point here about a proof. Um, there are models which evade the BGV theorem, they're not uh, plausible, or at least according to Alan Guth, they don't have plausible assumptions or reasonable assumptions, but there are models that um, evade the theorem. And so it is possible to come up with a model that is past eternal. And in fact, um, Sean Carroll uh, supports one of those, the, uh, the Aguirre uh, Groton model. It's interesting, though, that, that Alan Guth wrote a paper on eternal inflation and its implications 
in which he talks about the fact that um, that this model looks um, like it. We'll on the other side. And he says that. Um, hey, so, sorry. Let, just pause for a second, Ronald. We'll we'll get you to sure. uh, to repeat that real quick. And what's hanging down? Sorry about that. Hey, hey, uh, Aaron, can you still hear us? This is our uh, American cord. Where's the other end of this one? Sorry, I just have a power issue. One sec. Okay, no, no problem. I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and mute, mute your channel, and then we'll. Uh, we'll um, but I'm still here. Okay. Okay. All right, Ronald. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, repeat, okay. repeat what you, what, what you were just saying. But the point I'm making here is that um, Alan Guth in his paper, Eternal Inflation and Its Implication talks about the fact that there are models that evade the BGB theorem. And he talks specifically about the aguirre grotten model, which is the one that Sean Carroll is supporting in this debate. And it's clear that Alan Guth is saying that uh, any model that evades the BGV theorem uh, has to have unreasonable or implausible assumptions. And so that obviously applies to the aguirre grotten model with its reversal of the arrow of time. Uh, Luke, why don't, we, uh, why don't we bring you in here? Oh, um... Yeah, because there, there is yeah, one part so, where, where Sean quotes Guth as saying that he believes in an internal universe. Yeah, that was odd. And, and I'm, as best as I know, I don't... You know, I tried to find this, but I don't know where Guth has defended that in a paper. So as as, it's, it's as in his Ronald paper, was pointing eternal, out... It, it's in his paper, Eternal uh, Inflation and Its Implications, published in 2007. Yeah, on page I've, got four, in, I've, I've got it in front of me, but the, he says in the debate, so uh, so Carol plays, I think it's a clip? Um, uh, anyway, Guth, uh, Guth says, uh, the universe is probably eternal, but we don't really know. And I don't know where he's actually defended that in print. Um, oh, he hasn't, no. Yeah, so uh, maybe there's something after then, but that's, that's why, uh, as a scientist, you want to know what other scientists have defended in print rather than just what they reckon. You know, because, you know, especially you send someone an email, they send it back in, you know, 10 minutes, you know, they're writing, you know, the last thing they do before they go to bed, whereas a paper, you really try and write it out. So right. if Guth thinks that, I want him to write a paper about it so we can work out what his reasons are. But as at the moment, we just don't have reasons. Why does why doesn't he think BGV proves the beginning? We don't know. Well, it's it's uh, interesting because when it when Carol showed the picture of Guth holding the sign, which is what happened. Um, right. I was shocked. I was, I was like, why, how did Guth, you know, why is he holding that sign? How, what did Sean Carroll do to persuade him to hold a sign that undermines his entire uh, relevant science papers and, and a theorem that bears his name? And, you know, why would it, a man do that? And I thought, well, eventually he's probably going to come out with a new paper that's going to explain uh, that he's found a new model or something that, uh, a reasonable way to evade the BGB theorem. And I thought, well, I'll just wait for the paper. And it's been six years. I no longer think a paper is coming, and I no longer think it's possible to come up with a model with reasonable assumptions that can evade a beginning. Yeah, it does sound like he opts for a model of the universe that just avoids the theorem, the BGV theorem. And uh, one of the things that Craig argued in the debate is that on Carroll's model, when you have uh, two different arrows of time, you're still going to have a, a beginning because it's not in the the one universe's past. So you have basically two universes splitting off and there's a beginning of time in, in both. Well, Aaron, let me bring Aaron in at that point, at this point. Uh, do you agree with, with Craig's yeah. argument here that in, uh, in, these in Carroll's model, you still have a beginning with a time reversal? I think my paper, when I talked about the thermodynamic beginning why in passing, uh, is probably what inspired him to make that remark. And I'm going to stand by that statement. Um, and actually, the funny thing is I'm going to say it's, it's partic if we take the approach Sean Carroll wants us to take and see cause and effect 
as being related to the thermodynamic era of time, then it seems to me an inevitable conclusion that we're going to want to call the low entropy place the beginning. Let me explain a little more. What usually happens in physics is that if we have a relationship between something that happens in an early moment of time and it's connected to something that happens at a later moment of time, why do we call the one that happened earlier the cause and the one that happened later the effect? Why not the other way around? It has to do with the arrow of time that says the universe started in a low entropy special state, but we aren't going to impose any special constraint on what kind of state the universe could end up in. And that turns out to be why uh, you know you can you can break an egg and scramble it, but it doesn't unscramble and leap back into the egg, which heals itself and so on. So that's what gives an order of cause and effect. So it seems to me if we lived in one of these universes that had some sort of contracting phase and a bounce and an expanding phase, and the low entropy thing is in the middle, by saying the low entropy thing is in the middle, another that's going to have the implication that. Uh, suppose just for, for the sake of as a convention, I'm going to call the middle time zero. So mm -hmm. it says for any positive value of time, I explain what's going there in reference to what started in time zero. And at any negative value of time, I also explain the conditions there with reference to time zero. But I do not explain the conditions at time zero with reference to anything at the uh, positive value of this t-coordinate or the later or the earlier negative value of the t-coordinate. To me, that means that if I'm thinking in terms of cause and effect, it's actually this t equals zero that's the beginning and both directions going out from it are to the future. So if, if that means this time equals zero state, this low entropy state in the middle, there's only two things. I, if I say, why was there a low entropy state in the middle? It seems like there's only two options. Either I can follow Carol and say, that's not a meaningful question. I'm not going to look for an answer to that question. Or I could say there's an explanation, but it has to be something outside the time stream altogether. Which All is right, let's get transcendental cause, I guess. Let's move on to the last clip. Unless anyone has any any further thoughts on this this point here, I did okay, want cool. to say a little bit about BGV. Okay, please, please. hit it. Um, the so the the interest of the BGV theorem is that it's really it's unlike Hawking or Penrose's singularity theorem. It's really just a statement of geometry. It's something that holds for any consistent space-time geometry you write down, as long as it's described by, by what's called Lorentzian metric, which is just the standard way of tied out geometry in general relativity. Basically what it says, uh, one way to explain the theorem is to say, the suppose you wanted to make your universe an expanding universe eternal to the past. It seems like you could do so, why don't I just build a model, as Carol says, by saying, okay, space is infinitely big, so I'll just model that like flat, uh, three-dimensional Euclidean space, and then I'll say, maybe that three-dimensional space is growing exponentially with time. So it's always there, it's always growing, seems like there's a past infinity. And there is a past infinity, but from the perspective of observers who are going along in the frame of reference defined by this cosmology. What the BGV theorem showed is that observers who are moving at a velocity relative to this frame of reference, any velocity at all, will actually reach a boundary of the universe at a finite moment of time as experienced by their own personal clock. So effectively what they're saying is any universe, so that was a very symmetrical setup. What the theorem says is you aren't going to evade this by coming up with some more complicated scenario. As long as it's any geometry at all, where things are expanding on average, you're always going to find a beginning somewhere, even if not strictly everywhere. And this is going to be a very difficult theorem to evade, because so long as any geometrical concepts of the space-time sort are applicable at all, it seems like maybe we'll be able to use this theorem. Now, it's true, every theorem has assumptions. 
And when we're talking about quantum gravity, we really don't know what a fully quantum gravitational space-time looks like. So I can never tell you that the theorem is perfectly watertight and there's absolutely no way to, to evade it if we understand quantum, quantum cosmology. But it's, it's a pretty general result. And I'd say in the current limited state of our knowledge, it's what I'd bet on. It's pretty, it seems it's a pretty extensive you know, and why assume that quantum geometry gives you the exact opposite answer that classical geometry does? <laughs> so well, I would like again, to... it's, it's theorems versus models. The theorem says this big class has a beginning, and then you have a model, an example, one possibility which doesn't have it. So, again, how do we weigh those up? I think the theorem should have more weight. So, Ronald, go on. So I was just going to make a, a couple of comments here that um, Aaron was talking about the fact that this only has one assumption to it, the BGV theorem. That's extremely important for people to understand. The, the more assumptions a theorem has, the, uh, the more ways there are to evade it, the more uh, situations, uh, more models that will be able to evade it successfully and with reasonable assumptions. Um, even the quantum e eternity theorem that, that Carroll put forward um, I think he listed out four or five assumptions that were a part of his theorem. And, and for him to claim that that's a better or stronger theorem than BGV just didn't make any sense at all to me. Um, if, if Carol had said BGV theorem, um, you know, Dr. Craig wants everybody to believe that BGV theorem proves the universe had a beginning, and, and then he would argue against that, then I, I would say that makes sense. Um, actually, Dr. Craig did not say that it proves a beginning. Uh, he says that it implies a beginning. And if Carroll had said um, the BGB implies a beginning, but it doesn't prove a beginning, I wouldn't have a problem with that. But when he says it doesn't imply a beginning, that's a real problem. That's a real problem. And in Carroll's paper, uh, he wrote a paper in 2014 called In What Sense Is the Early Universe Fine-Tuned? And, and he talks about BGV theorem in there just a little bit. And he kind of argues against a paper by Mithani and Vilinkin, which um, is titled, Did the Universe Have a Beginning? And um, there he realizes that the, it's not a proof, which I'm able to accept, but my real, I really have a problem when he says that it doesn't imply a beginning. Of course it implies a beginning. And um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Fair enough. All right, are we, uh, are we ready to move on to the last clip here? So we have, we have actually two more clips queued up, but I think we're only going to have time to get to one of them. The second clip is on fine-tuning, and so we're just going to kind of leave that one alone. We mentioned that at the very beginning of this, if you're watching this live, we mentioned that uh, Dr. Luke Barnes has, has produced some videos in response to Carol's five points against fine tuning. So you can find those online on Alan Hainline's YouTube channel. Do you know what the title of his channel is called? No, I'll look it up and tell you in a minute. Okay. Uh, either way, I'll, I'll provide a link in the, the first comment of this video. We'll provide a link to that. So, uh, all right. So here's the next clip. And this one is actually the longest clip of the night. It's about four and a half minutes long. What this one is, is it's a conversation back and forth between Carol. He's responding to the first premise of the Kalam cosmological argument, he gives a reason to think that it's false, and then Craig responds to it in his closing, and then Carol responds to that in his closing. So it's three clips back to back, total four and a half minutes. Here we go. The universe is different than our everyday experience. That doesn't sound like a surprising statement, but we really need to take it to heart, to look at a modern cosmological model and say, yes, but what was the cause? It's like looking at someone taking pictures with an iPhone and saying, but where does the film go? It's not that the answer is difficult or inscrutable, it's completely the wrong question to be asking. And in fact, it's a little technical, most of this, uh, my second talk here, but I think it's worth getting it right. Why should we expect 
that there are causes or explanations or reason why in the universe in which we live. It's because the physical world inside of which we're embedded has two important features. There are unbreakable patterns, laws of physics, things don't just happen, they obey the laws, and there is an arrow of time stretching from the past to the future. The entropy was lower in the past, increases toward the future. Therefore, when you find some event or state of affairs B today, we can very often trace it back in time to one or a couple of possible predecessor events that we therefore call the cause of that, which leads to be according to the laws of physics. But crucially, both of these features of the universe that allow us to speak the language of causes and effects are completely absent when we talk about the universe as a whole. We don't think that our universe is part of a bigger ensemble that, that obeys laws. Even if it's part of the multiverse, the multiverse is not part of a bigger ensemble that obeys laws. Therefore, nothing gives us the right to demand some kind of external cause. The idea that our intuitions about cause and effect that we get from the everyday experience of the world in this room should somehow be extended without modification to the fundamental nature of reality is fairly absurd. Dr. Carroll challenges the first premise uh, that uh, if the universe came into existence, there is a transcendent cause that brought the universe into being. And honestly, I'm, I'm quite astonished that he would think the universe can literally pop into being out of nothing. Let me just give three arguments for why there must be a cause. First of all, it seems to me a metaphysical first principle that being doesn't come from non-being, that things don't just pop into existence from literally nothing. Nothingness has no properties, no potentialities. Uh, it, it's not anything. And so it seems to me inconceivable metaphysically to think the universe could come into being from nothing. Secondly, if the universe could come into being from nothing, then why is it that only universes can pop into being out of nothing? Why not bicycles and Beethoven uh, and root beer? What makes nothingness so discriminatory? If universes could pop into being out of nothing, then anything and everything should pop into being out of nothing. Since it doesn't, that suggests that things that come into being have causes. And finally, all the empirical evidence we have supports the truth of the causal principle. When Dr. Carroll says, oh, but the universe is different than our experience, this is really committing what Alexander Proust calls the taxi cab fallacy. That is to say, you go with the causal principle until you reach your desired goal, and then you think you can just dismiss it like a hack because you don't want there to be a, a cause of, uh, of your entity, the universe. But if the universe came into existence, if the universe is not eternal, then surely it would need to have a cause. And in fact, to deny this is unscientific because the whole project of contemporary cosmogony is to try to find what is the cause of the universe. So on his principle, it would be a science stopper and would destroy the, his very field of expertise. I tried to give the reason why the causation analysis that we use for objects within the universe does not apply to the universe, but that more or less whizzed on by. Dr. Craig gets a lot of mileage out of the presumable, the presumed nuttiness of things just popping into existence. Why don't bicycles just pop into existence? Again, I tried to explain what makes the universe different, but more importantly, the phrase popping into existence is not the right one to use when you're talking about the universe. It sounds as if it's, a, it's something that happens in time, but that's not the right way to do it because there is no before the beginning, if there is a beginning. The correct thing to say is there was a first moment of time. When you say it that way, it doesn't sound so implausible. The question is, is there a model in which that's true? Do the equations of the model hang together? Does the model fit the data? And we have plausibly positive answers to all of those. Well, Luke, I think I'm starting to see this trend here about all this emphasis on models, possi possible models. But it, so as I was listening to the debate, this this whole thing about causation and the first, co the first premise of the Kalam cosmological argument what, what kind of struck me about this one is, as I was looking into it pretty deeply, as I was reading the transcripts and everything, was that it seemed like they just were talking past each other. I think you agree on this, is that they were using basically two different understandings, if you want, of causation. Dr. Craig has his understanding of causation, and then Dr. Carroll's is a little bit more strict. He, I think, and Aaron, you pointed this out earlier, he, he limits it to just formal causation, basically. And so it seems like they were basically just talking past each other. But in, in the follow-up articles that, that Craig, Dr. Craig wrote, I think I, I'm pretty convinced that his 
his reasons to think that that Carol's argument here just doesn't work. It's actually a non sequitur. Anyways, Luke, what are your, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I, th- I think let me just. There's so much that he said about here. It's really interesting. But let me just zero in on one thing. What Carol says is when we usually talk, when Sh- what Sean says is when we usually talk about causation, we've got a specific scenario. We have a universe. We have an arrow of time. We have laws of nature which control the whole thing. We don't have that when we're talking about the universe. And so therefore he says, and uh, let me try and quote him directly, therefore nothing gives us the right to demand some kind of external cause. That's too strong a conclusion. The conclusion should have been, therefore, um, extrapolating from a, the usual understanding of causality within a physical universe gives us no reason to demand an external cause. Okay, if we were trying to say, I have causes in this context, therefore I have, I have to have one of the universe, well, we're not in the same context, that so much is true. That doesn't mean there's nothing that demands an external cause. The thing that, that demands an external cause is, is the arguments Carol put forward. If you have a universe that just exists without a, any sort of reason, in particular, which you know comes into existence without any sort of reason, it's then a complete mystery why other things don't start to exist without any reason, given that you don't need a, any sort of... There's, there's nothing that decides whether or not something can exist or not. There's nothing that controls it. You don't need a cause for something to exist. So I, I think Carol's argument... If, is aimed at a sort of induction from I look at causes in a physical context and then I move to a thing, a more general thing. Whereas actually Craig's point is, and this is the point where I suspect that actually the Kalam cosmology, the cosmological argument is actually just the contingency argument in disguise. But this is, never mind that. Um, he's, he's saying, okay, even if you had, you know, there's got to be something that decides why a universe exists rather than not or or decides whether something can exist rather than not. A more general reason, maybe cause is the wrong word for that. But I think once you see that, Carol's argument's a perfectly fine argument. It's just that he's, he tries to push it too far to say there's no reason to look for a cause, whereas actually Craig's arguments give you that more than just extrapolating from physical scenarios to a cause. Yeah, and he didn't even actually, he never used an argument that was ex- extrapolating from our ordinary experience to, to everything. He used an inductive argument, which is completely normal. And then he used a, a metaphysical, for, he said it was a metaphysical first principle. And then he used a, a, another really, really interesting argument that has been defended actually at length in a fairly recent book called, I think it's called Necessary Existence by Alexander Proust and Josh Rasmussen, where they yeah. give a technical version of this argument that is extremely powerful in my view. You said something that was. Go ahead. Can I? There's one. It is relevant. His, his ar- argument is relative, relevant because uh, Craig is relying on our intuition to say that the the fir- f- our intuition in in favor of the first premise. Where do we get the idea that things that begin need to have causes? And what Craig, what Carol is saying? Oh, we get that just from our experience of the world. And the point I'm saying that's fine. We can also get it from these sorts of arguments about things popping into existence. Yeah, and and, and that, one of the things that Craig points out is that like when you when you just conceptualize, and you can't really do this, but when you just think about the term nothing, nothing can't do anything, and so that that alone, without even if you don't think about your inductive experience of the world, nothing can't produce something. So any um going going back to something else that you said about the Kalam being the contingency argument in disguise. I think that there's a lot of overlap there. The the difference, I think, is that in the contingency argument, it's open to an infinite regress of causes, whereas the Kalam cosmological argument argues for some type of first cause or like a finite causal series. The the whole history of causes in in existence has to be finite. I think that's really what di- differentiates. But a Kalam style argument with a contingency argument is basically this idea that you've got to have a finite causal history. Whereas with the contingency argument is completely compatible with an eternal universe, could be completely eternal. But the question would still be, why does an eternal universe exist rather than a finite universe or some different type of eternal universe? So that's that's what I would say there. Aaron, and then Ronald, and then we'll go to, to Q&A. Okay, Aaron, yeah. yeah so any, any thoughts on the question? There's a way. Yeah, so I think that um, I, did, I did think that Carol was correct that that there's 
talking about the universe popping into existence, if you think that time was actually created at the beginning of the universe, I say created as a theist, but obviously that's not the word he would use. But if you think time came into existence, I think he's right that you shouldn't think of a beginning as first there was nothing and then there was something. Nothing yeah. just means there was no time no, b- before then. So um, I think, I think Carol scored a little bit of a point there. Um, and in fact, I'm not completely sure um, that everything that Craig said was really responsive to Carol's reductionistic viewpoint, since Carol did, in fact, state reasons why he uh, thought that causality did apply in a certain regime. He talked about these unbreakable uh, patterns or regularities or laws. I guess I guess I feel that these reductionistic ideas, oh, I can do without this notion of, of cause or something, they, they often seem very plausible locally, but you really have to have a picture of the whole of philosophy in order to really evaluate it. It's like fixing the engine of your car. So if you're a reductionist, it's sort of like saying, oh, is this part of my engine actually used for anything? So you grab a wrench, or or a, or a saw and you chop it off and you throw it away and if the car still starts running then you say oh i didn't need that part but it's far from clear that you aren't going to need that part later on when you study some other aspect of the world like philosophy of mind or some other area of philosophy of science or something so it's easy enough for carol to say oh i don't need the causal principle here and now because it's not convenient but there's a question I think a very deep question of whether he can really be, uh, be consistent with that everywhere he wants it. I might argue when he talks about, um, you know, he says there's maybe Carroll himself, you know, this is, this is a real limitation of the debate format that the people are trying to score points. But I'd prefer to have a conversation with Carroll mm-hmm. if he were here and say, well, you know, what what is it you believe about these unbreakable patterns or regularities? Do you think it's a purely descriptive? Like as if I say, oh, I flip a coin, I happen to get 10 heads in a row. In that case, it would be like a big fat coincidence that the laws of physics keep working. If I say it's not a coincidence, if I say, oh, there's, it had to be the 10 co- uh, heads in a row, you know, the, the unbreakable patterns, they weren't just unbro- unbroken, they're unbreakable. It sounds like Sean Carroll himself believes there's this transcendent thing that has to transcend space, time, and control the universe. It's just he calls it patterns or laws of nature, and and he 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 doesn't he doesn't maybe realize that he's introduced something that's every bit as much immaterial as uh, a theist does. Certainly, the laws of physics aren't an object that appears in cosmology like a galaxy or a rock or something like that. Good point, Ronald. Yeah, do you have any additional thoughts before we yeah, get to Q&A? Yeah, my, my thought here is that what Carol is really doing is is what I would call special pleading. He's We see causes in, in everything, except when it gets to a particular point where he doesn't want to have a cause. And then he, he makes a, a case that is, you know, some would argue plausible, but um, I, don't, I don't really see it as plausible. I, I think if... Everything needs a cause, and I don't see why the universe itself doesn't need a cause. So <clears throat> that that would be the the first point I would make. the uh, The other thing I would go back to, Cameron, is what you said earlier about the finite uh, number of causes. We know that an infinite regress of causes is a logical fallacy. That can't that can't be. So something has to be eternal. So our our choices here is that the universe itself is eternal, or if there was nothing, no time, no space, no matter, no energy, and, and the universe came into existence, there has to be a cause for that. It can't be a, a, an infinite regress. So the cause itself has to be eternal, and the only eternal cause outside of the universe is what I would call God. That's I, I use the concept of minimal theism. At, at one point in the debate, 
Carol says that theism is not well defined. My my definition for theism in terms of uh, an argument or a discussion about cosmology is that um, God is a personal agent who's responsible for the ultimate beginning of the universe. That's the definition. Whatever that looks like, that doesn't prove the God of of uh, the philosophers. It doesn't prove uh, the God of the Bible, but it does prove that there's somebody out there who created because something has to be eternal and it's not the universe, most likely. All right. Well, I think we're going to go ahead and turn to Q&A here. And unfortunately, I can't pull them up on the screen because of the, the format that I have here. So I'm just going to have to read them out. And uh, we'll try to limit our responses just because we've actually had a lot of Super Chats come in. So we'll try to get through as many of these as we can. I, I can't promise that we'll get through all of them. And I really apologize if we don't get to your Super Chat. But let's start with John from Cranman Photo Cinema. He says, after all the evidence is laid out and you still say the universe probably had a beginning, does this probably refer to a hunch or some extra piece of evidence? If the latter, what is it? Well, I would put the probability, I'm not a mathematical physicist like these other two guys, but as a philosopher interested in philosophy of science, I would put the probability that the universe had a beginning. And, and when I say universe, I mean universe slash multiverse. So if the multiverse exists, it also most likely had a beginning. I would put the probability at something like 99.98%. Uh, there are models out there that are past eternal, but as Alan Guth wrote in his paper, they have unreasonable assumptions or implausible assumptions. And uh, I haven't seen anything. Uh, so I, I side more with um, Alexander Vilinkin on this than, than uh, Sean Carroll. Any thoughts, Aaron? Well, it's certainly wrong to characterize it as merely a hunch that we <laughs> have, you know, theorems and, as Carol says, models that help us answer this question. So I think there is, is, you know, there's evidence of a scientific character that's not just about guessing. That being said, none of us have the ultimate theory of quantum gravity yet, so we can never be, in, in that sense, we have to go by hunches, but it seems to me the best bet is to use the data we do have of the models of the universe and theorems we have that do work and extrapolate from there. And if you if you assess it that way, I don't say the evidence is completely unmixed, but it seems very, very likely that the universe had a beginning. Um, I actually did a 10 part series about this on my blog, discussing the evidence on both sides. And there's there's a lot more evidence pointing for a beginning than the other way. All right, let's move on to another question. Or this was this is a comment. And I'm I'll, I'm interested to get your thoughts on it. Russell Jones says, "All previous science is false. Ergo, current science is false." Luke. Well, uh, <laughs> I no, that doesn't follow at all. Uh, but we do have to worry about the fact that you know probably. You know, you know, it's very unlikely that, that we're done with physics. So what do we do about the fact, as, as, as Aaron said, we don't have a final theory? And the answer was just the one that he gave. We just do the best with the information that we have. I mean, it's a question of just being rational. Look at the information that you have, take into account the uncertainties, try and weigh things up. Yeah, uh, like I said, we have, we have interest, you know, we, we, we know something about the universe. We can at least ask what that tells us about a beginning or not. It's entirely possible that everything we learn tomorrow will erase everything we think we know today, but we'll, we'll deal with that when it happens. All right, let's move on to another question. This one's from Maxwell. It's, this isn't a question. It's a, it's a comment. And uh, okay, Maxwell Yates says, so God created a cause of the universe. Got it. But if everything needs a cause, then what caused God? Boom, roasted. <laughs> so let me, let me take a stab at this one. And this goes back to uh, something that I said just a little while ago. Uh, based upon the fact that an infinite regress of causes is a logical fallacy, something has to be eternal to the past. And so our choices are the universe or God. And 
science has shown us that most likely the universe is not eternal in the past. And so most likely God exists and is eternal. What are your thoughts? Uh, well, so, I mean, th go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on this. Well, I think uh, Ed Faser has some great things to say about this, particularly that nobody ever actually, uh, who is a respectable philosopher, ever made this argument beginning everything has a cause, precisely because it would lead to the problematic. It would not, uh, you know, nobody, uh, in that case, you couldn't say God was uncaused. A cosmological argument always begins, it's equally much a reflection on the universe as it is about God. It looks at the universe and it sees some dependency or limitation. And so you always, in any uh, respectable cosmological argument, you always have uh, a... Uh, uh, your premises are always phrased in a way that don't refer to God. In the Kalam case... The premise is everything that comes into being has a cause. If that's a correct causal principle, it doesn't apply to God because he didn't come into being. Um, other philosophers have looked at things like contingent. If something could have been multiple different ways, then we need an explanation for which of the ways it actually is. But if something was necessary, it can only be one way, then you don't need an explanation. So there's multiple ways people run these arguments but no version of the argument that any respectable philosopher has constructed is vulnerable to that criticism. Uh, so Russell Jones, he clarified, he says that he was being sarcastic with his comment about all previous science is false, ergo current science is false. So that was a clarification there. All right, let's move on to another question. Uh, this one's another one from John Cranman, our, our videographer. He says, Luke, can you describe the singularity in layman's terms? Is it equivalent to nothing if you go far back enough? Uh, no, it, it, so here's what happens. You, you try and you, you have a bunch of equations that describes in this case, gravity, and you try to solve them. And then you find, uh, you ask a, what should be a perfectly reasonable question like, what was the density of the universe when T equals zero? And you ask your equations that, and they come back with an answer infinity. And then you go, oh, uh, that's bad. <laughs> what the heck just happened? Um, and so you try and work out, and you discover what you've got there is a boundary of to space-time. Just uh, Sean said this actually quite well in the debate. It, it the thing to say is that there was that there is a first moment to time. Um, another way of saying that, which Aaron referred to, is you know, you, know, you have your own clock. Your clocks tick. Go back in time and watch it tick in reverse. Does it tick an infinite number of times, or only a finite number of times? And then the answer is, if there's a singularity, a finite number of times. So it's not the singularity is a boundary to space time. So in the way that you know, in um, yeah, it's a boundary to space time. It, it's sort of the edge of space time where there can't be any. You can't go before that point. Whereas usually there wouldn't be a boundary. You can just go to t equals infinity. The reason why the singularity theorems of Hawking and Penrose are so powerful is they show that within general relativity, these singularities are not uh, isolated pathologies, but something that turn up all over the place. Okay, let's move on to another uh, another question. This one's from Meow Meow Meow. He says, Vilenkin says that all space-time has an absolute origin and that the laws of physics have platonic existence explanatorily prior to all space-time reality. He disagrees, he disagrees with Guth, whose contribution to the debate was deceptive. This is just a, another comment. So I don't think, well, I, I probably disagree slightly with Ronald on this. So here's what Goose says in the conclusion of the paper that Ronald says. Uh, he says, the inflating region must have had a past boundary and that new physics other than inflation is needed to describe what happens at the boundary. So mm -hmm. I think Goose thinks that this new physics is going to save us from a beginning somehow. I'd love him to explain why he thinks that and what he thinks that new physics is going to be. So this is the second last, par third last paragraph, if you're looking it up. Um, so, you know, um, yeah, I just like, Goose, so I don't think Goose is being deceptive. I, I think he obviously be believes that. I just love him to explain why in a paper, like not just in an right. email, just properly explain in and put it in print. I'd love to hear it. 
Right. So let me let me go back and read another uh, quote from the same. I think we're talking about the same paper, right? Eternal inflation and its implications. Yeah. Okay. On page fourteen, he asks this question: Is the universe, if the universe can be eternal into the future, is it possible that it is also eternal into the past? Here, I will describe a recent theorem, and he cites BGB theorem, which shows, under plausible assumptions, that the answer to this question is no. No, the universe cannot be eternal into the past under plausible assumptions. Now, if you go down to the, uh, on page 16, he says, the theorem does show, however, that an eternally inflating model of the, of the type usually assumed cannot be complete. Some new physics, i.e. not inflation, would, have, would be needed to describe the past boundary of the inflating region. So this is similar to what you were reading. Then he goes on, one possibility would be some kind of quantum creation event. Now here he seems to be um, advocating for a view similar to Vilenkin's view of a, a, a creation event from a quantum nucleation. So it's sim somewhat similar to the proposal put forward by Tryon in 1973 of a, a quantum fluctuation. Only it, it, with Vilenkin, the idea is that you have this tunneling event in the absence of any space or time. And, and that seems to be what Guth here has in, in mind, is a creation event, um, a quantum creation event similar to Vilenkin's idea not a past eternal universe. Aaron, I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on this. Uh, well, the model you just mentioned is a sort of alternative to the Hartle Hawking uh, proposal that still has some similar features and, right. and actually explains the data a bit better because it leads more naturally to inflation, uh, I believe. The, um, it's... Uh, I think that uh, I mean, Belenkin is is right to to say that his theorem is evidence for for a beginning. The most natural way to avoid a beginning is to have a a bounce scenario where the universe contracts and then expands. And a lot of the models like that reverse the arrow of time. In which case, as I argued earlier. Uh, I think that still counts as a beginning if we're talking about errors of cause and effect and explanation. Um, yep. Okay, uh, let's move on to, th th this is another super chat from Meow Meow Meow. And he says, P.S. See the Lincoln's interviews with Robert Kuhn, aside from his 2006 book. And he also says an eternal universe wouldn't be a problem as most cosmological arguments don't require a beginning. For example, Phaser, Rasmussen, Etc. So that's just a, a comment he wanted to leave for everyone. Maverick Christian asks, thank you for your super chat. He says, what is the current scientific consensus, if any, about whether the scientific evidence favors a cosmic beginning? So uh, let's pass it over to uh, to Aaron, since you wrote those 10 blog posts about this. Uh, yeah, well, the I think I, I feel like I already answered this question, but <laughs> I think the, the evidence... Um, strongly suggests, without absolutely proving, that there was a beginning of time, of some sort. Certainly, it's I, well, since since I said that already, maybe let me say something that I think is pretty much beyond all doubt, which is that there is no doubt in uh, contemporary cosmology, it's about as certain as a scientific conclusion can be that the universe as we know it came into existence. That whatever the universe came from, uh, it wasn't just sitting here around uh, forever doing, uh, uh, doing galaxies and stars. Uh, that certainly, it certainly came from a beginning that was very different from, from where it uh, started from. Uh, although, you know, as Christian, I, I <coughs> remember, of course, people have believed that God created the universe long before we had Big Bang cosmology. So I always think it's a little strange when everyone acts as though uh, the defense of Christianity depends on what I tell them about this point. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to talk about your book? Luke? Uh, yeah, just, just to shamelessly plug. So Geraint Lewis and I have a new book out called The Cosmic Revolutionary's Handbook which is just about what exactly what Aaron just said. Why do we believe that 
the Big Bang model, at least, is a good description of the universe from a very early time. And that, yeah, the, it's not the case. The universe has just been sitting around doing nothing. So this is just, just some good old-fashioned cosmology and evidence. And if you want to overthrow the Big Bang theory, we'll tell you how to do that as well, if you want to have some fun with that. <laughs> okay, so, so Maverick Christian just clarified in the live chat. He said, I was not asking about the evidence. I was asking about the scientific consensus. Oh, so you mean I like think, sociologically? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think I think most uh, cosmologists would probably agree with Vilenkin's statement, not all of them. But I think I think there's an important sociological point to be made here, actually, yes. which yeah. is people always assume that academics are primarily pursuing the truth. And at one level we are, but we pursue the truth by a special method, which is uh, trying to find novel ideas worthy of publication. <laughs> and so there's, um, if I come up with an idea tomorrow for how to make an eternal universe or evade some assumption in some famous theorem, and if that idea seems interesting, I'm going to publish that paper. It's my job to publish that paper. And that doesn't necessarily mean that I believe that that's going to turn out to be true. It means that it's my job to think of as many ways uh, things could go as possible and try to sift. Now, there's also a role of sifting between them and judging them, but it can sometimes be a little bit of a conflict of interest to have the people whose career success depends on always thinking of a new, more interesting model to um, talk about where the uh, scientific consensus lies. I feel in many ways, I know Craig referred to my quantum version of the singularity theorem, but in many ways I feel like if you're uh, you're better off looking at the old data, what people talked about 10 or 20 years ago, than trying to read the tea leaves of what people are publishing now. Because people publish things because they're interesting, not necessarily because they actually think they're true. I mean, they think it's worth considering whether it's true, but that's a different question. This is why okay. just counting models isn't enough. Right. Okay, let's move on. Uh, we have a few more super chats to get through. We'll, I think we'll we'll have time to get through them. So this one is from Born Chupacabra. Born Chupacabra. Two questions. One: How did you how do you refute Carroll's view of causation, the Humean Russell style? And then two: Is the Kalam valid on B theory, and does it imply a finite future? So I, guess I that's think three questions. A, a couple of. <laughs> A couple of quick things here. First of all, if you want to deal with what Carol thinks in total, there's his book, The Big Picture, absolutely worth a read uh, to lay out his whole picture here. He is a Humean about causation, which means about the laws of nature, which means that uh, he doesn't believe the laws of nature are a separate thing. There is just the stuff that happens in the universe. And then we try to summarize that as best we can. And that's what a law of nature is. Uh, and actually, David Albert and, and uh, Barry Lower are two philosophers of science who are very good to read on this. They're very clear about that. David Albert's book, After Physics, is very good. Um, I think, uh, so I've written a review of, of this book, which you can go and find online, an inference review. In terms of, of I, I just think that it, again, it doesn't, one of the things that's a problem is it doesn't answer uh, Craig's point that he made there, again, popping into existence, as, as Aaron said, is quite rightly not, not the way to say it, but it just, what? why do some things exist rather than other things? And if you allow entire universes to exist without any reason or sufficient, you know, whatever, call to cause or whatever, then then you've got a problem with, you. you have a reality in which things don't need any sort of reason in order to exist. And that, that you know, then why don't, you know, dogs and cats exist without reasons. Um, so I think that 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 sort of argument is is a good argument against the sort of Humean reduction uh, of causality. And I forget what the yeah. other question was. The other question was about B-theory, but let's get uh, some more thoughts on this, on the refuting Carroll's view of causation. I would say one of the, one of the, the well, just pulling back and just what, how do we do philosophy in the first place? I think the first thing we'd have to do is get clear on, and that's why I like the fact that you mentioned his book. We got to get clear on like, what is the philosophical principle that he's forwarding here about causation? What is that? And then what you do or what you can do is look for certain counterexamples. So is there a case where we have, where we have a clear case of causation that doesn't fall under this view of causation that he's forwarding? And I, I, one of the things that Richard Swinburne does in his work is he differentiates between scientific 
and personal explanations. And it doesn't seem like that his view of causation is open because he, he defines causation in terms of laws of nature. It doesn't really seem like he's open to personal explanations in terms of intentions and beliefs and goals. And so that's something that initially pops up in my mind as a, as a potential counterexample, which is not just one counterexample. It'd be uh, a whole lot of counterexamples. We, we are, well, he's kind of brushing aside efficient causation, essentially, if we want to put it in Aristotelian terms. But anyway, so just to, to kind of overview of, of what my analysis would, would at least look like, because I haven't done it yet, would be to spell out very clearly what his principle is, what his view of causation is, and then look for very, very clear counterexamples to it. Aaron, what are your what are your thoughts here? And then we'll one move to some, some responses objection. to be there. One classic objection to the Humean notion of causation is that it doesn't actually give enough information to distinguish between true laws of nature and fake laws of nature. If you just say a law is just an exceptionless principle which just happens to describe everything in space and time, well, it seems like I can come up with with possible counterexamples that we wouldn't want to call laws. For example, it's an exceptionless principle of history up to the present day that no woman has yet been elected president of the United States. One of them came pretty close, but it didn't happen. But I'm not going to say that just because it didn't happen that it's a law of nature that it can't happen. So it seems like something more is required for something to be a law of nature than simply for it to correctly describe everything in the space-time history of the universe. And if you ask what is that more that we're looking for, I feel like it's going to go beyond mere description. It's going to have to have something of a more metaphysical flavor, some actual oomph or something. I like that a lot. Okay, let's move on. Uh, we, we only have a couple more minutes here. Okay, so... Uh, Sorry, we'll leave the, the B-theory question aside. Meow, meow, meow again says Cameron Vilinkin re replies to William Lane Craig and he gives a link. So if you want to go back through and check those, you are you're feel free uh, feel free to do that. But this is just another uh, a very nice comment from Russell Jones. He says, Luke is always great, but looking forward to hearing more from Aaron and Ronald in the future. This was a tour de force. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's do this. So do you have any... Uh, well, no, let's... Uh, not clo not turn to closing thoughts yet. Let's talk about who everyone thinks won the debate. And I'll start because I already gave it away at the beginning. So I th I was initially convinced that Craig lost. And then as I worked through the transcripts with a buddy of mine who's uh, he's he's an amateur. He, he he's a he has a very big and deep interest in cosmology and physics. And so I kind of worked through it with him and uh, came to the opposite conclusion for for uh, a few reasons so anyways let, let me get uh aaron's let me get your thoughts and i, I already know it. i i have an idea of how you're going to respond but i'm curious who do you think won this and why yeah. well i feel i feel so the first thing i wanted to say is i actually think it's not very important who won the debate that debates are maybe more of a forum for airing ideas and the idea that there has to be just a winner or loser it, it's it's sort of like team dynamics and when maybe maybe it you know I, I'm a little annoyed in general by the debate format because it involves people making long speeches when like Socrates I think we could get so much uh, we can get uh, closer to the truth by having a, a in-depth conversation with each other and answering each other's questions and trying to pursue truth together and not in this adversarial sort of a way um, so in a way it's sort of a bad question that being said, reviewing the debate recently, um, if I had to give an answer, uh, I would say that I actually think just judge it. If, if I assume that I have to give this answer just based on what was presented in the debate and not based on you know what I agree or disagree with or what other arguments I think they should have said, I'm just judging what they did say, I personally think uh, Carol actually did better in the debate, and I'd give it to him. And the main reason I'd do so is that he sort of took uh, Craig by surprise in challenging a different premise of the Kalam argument than what uh, Craig was expecting. And Craig didn't actually get around to responding to that properly until his closing remarks. I don't feel that his closing remarks were sufficiently detailed to really explain why Carroll was wrong about his theory of causation, which to give him credit, he at least outlined uh, 
uh, in a fair amount of detail why he thinks what he thinks. So I person, even though I I strongly disagree actually with the the viewpoint on causation that Carol was putting forward, I'd actually give it to him. Man, I I we we should have spent more time on that. I disagree with that sharply, but uh, maybe maybe we can talk about that <laughs> right in yourself. another stream or something. We yeah, have all right. Well, debate about who won the debate, but I don't know if that's <laughs> There you go. We'll just schedule you off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, Luke, who do you think won? So I think Aaron's put his finger on a really important point that it's really easy in these debates that I, uh, I imagine myself debating against Carol. I'm like, I'd have totally won that. Um, <laughs> of course. Now that. Um, but. I, I I sort of think it was it was, um, uh, yeah. Once you realise that actually the the talk of the models, even though Carol's almost you know he's mostly correct about those, and when Craig tries to defend the the or, or when 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 Craig tries to say this model actually doesn't prove that there's a beginning, he he he's not particularly great on that. Once you realize actually all of that discussion is slightly beside the point, it's not, we, we want to know what everyone is saying, not what individuals are saying. Um, once you get that, actually, a lot of the debate, the, neither of them were scoring points. They looked like they were scoring points, but they weren't. Mm -hmm. um, again, I think in the back and forth, it was sort of about even. The, for me, the most important point is, is is you know I'll get this from a, a Carol debate will make me want to read more of Carol's stuff just to try and get in his head because he's clearly thought things through and and he's worth having a closer look as opposed to say a you know debate with other cosmologists that Ka that Craig has been under where, where I just you know it's two hours of my life I'm not getting back. <laughs> I okay, know that's and then what Ronald. win means. I guess you're trying to sell books at what's win means. <laughs> so. In uh, in my opinion, w watching the debate, I think most of the people who watch the debate debate would would walk away thinking that Carol won, because he comes across as I'm a cosmologist. Dr. Craig is not a cosmologist. I know what's going on. Um, Dr. Craig is wrong about BGV theorem. Uh, I think most most viewers would think that Carol won the debate. Um, however, when you really know what the science papers say, um, in my view, Dr. Craig won the debate because he was um, he was right on the science. Fair enough. All right. Well, let's uh, any any closing thoughts as we close this out. Anything that we didn't I think cover it's a that we ironic maybe that uh, Craig's uh, performance was a little better on the science and Carol's was maybe a little more interesting on the philosophy, <laughs> regardless of who you think won in terms of the amount of time and effort they spent uh, bolstering that side of the, the case. It was kind That's of an interesting, interesting thought. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, let's. Uh, I guess that's going to do it. So I really appreciate you guys, Aaron. Luke and Ronald for taking the time out to do this. Luke, it, what time was well, it when you, you so uh, when we, hosting. yes, thank yeah, you for yeah. hosting. No problem. What, what time was it Luke? Cause okay. So Luke lives in Australia, Aaron lives in the UK and then Ronald's in, in California. I'm in Texas. So this was like magical to just be able to schedule this at the right time for all of us to be on at the same time, except Luke had to wake up a couple hours <laughs> at, earlier than he knew. At a does. quarter to six, which is not a magically right time for me. But you know, <laughs> I'll, 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 uh, yeah, I'm happy to talk about this debate lots. It's, it was really interesting. Excellent. Well, thank you guys again for coming on, and uh, we'll definitely. And Aaron, do... what time is it there where you are? Uh, it's half an hour to midnight. Half an hour past right. midnight. It's thank almost you for staying up late. Yeah. Oh, I usually stay up till midnight. It's not a problem. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let me talk to the audience for a second. I really appreciate you guys watching this entire video. It's pretty long. It's about two and a half hours we've been going. So I appreciate it. If you've watched this whole thing, kudos to you. And what you can do if you'd like to support this channel is head over to patreon.com slash capturing Christianity. And you can support us through, uh, through Patreon, it, you can do $5 a month, $20, $25 a month, however much you'd like to do if you'd like to, to see this ministry continue to flourish and continue to put out videos like this on a regular basis. That's the way that you can do it. If you don't have money, you can't do 
uh, anything financial right now, the easy, the what you can do is subscribe and turn on the bell so you can get notifications when we post new videos. That is completely free and it helps us out a lot. It makes sure it, it makes it ensures that YouTube will continue to push out our content to new people and uh, the the channel can continue growing. So appreciate whatever you decide to do. I really appreciate it and uh, think like I said, thank you again for watching and we'll see you next time.